Welcome everyone uh, to this meeting of the Communica uh, Community Preservation Act Committee on November 17th, 2022. Uh, I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. Pursuant to the decision of the town of Amherst as permitted by the state, we are meeting remotely. I'm going to call now on all the committee members to make sure that you can hear and that you can be heard. Um, <clears throat> My name's Sam McLeod, I'm the chair, I'm here. Uh, Tim Neal. Uh, here. We can hear you. Uh, Andy McDougal. Present. David Williams. Present. Uh, excuse me, Kate, Katie allen -Zoller. Present. Michelle Labby. Present. Mike, excuse me, Matt Kane. Present. And Robin Fordham is not here as of yet to my understanding. Uh, although I'm sure she'll be here soon enough. Um, we are going to need to have someone to take minutes for th this meeting. Um, the meetings are recorded and they're available. Uh, we have a method for assistance after the fact. Would anyone like to volunteer? I'll volunteer. Tim wins the lottery. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. No problem. <laughs> so um, we have a busy agenda this evening. We have six historic preservation uh, proposals, um, and you, they may or may not run over. My my thoughts are that uh, we start as soon as um, presenters are ready. If they're ready in advance of six fifteen, uh, I'd be an advocate for so. I don't either. Mm -hmm. But we can keep an eye on that. The uh, first item on the agenda is to approve any outstanding minutes. I don't believe we have any outstanding minutes available. Uh, if if I'm incorrect, uh, someone please speak up. No, you're correct. Okay. So we have a little bit of time here. Uh, I, I'm wondering if... Uh, how long might the any financials update take, Sonia? Um, real quick, because I don't have any financial updates at the moment. There's no changes from the last week. Okay. We should be getting our state aid pretty soon, though, so I might have it next week. Uh, I did see, yeah, I saw an email from uh, uh, Stuart mm -hmm. referencing We haven't received it yet. There were some dollar amounts in a spreadsheet, but not the $20 million or anything. Um, Okay, so uh, I, I'd rather wait on the uh, straw poll uh, process because that might be a more, uh, might take a little bit longer and I don't want to risk cutting any of the uh, presentations delayed after they're started. I want to start on time as soon as we can. So we've got a little bit of uh, downtime here. Uh, I would say to the new members uh, and to any others, we do have a Facebook page for the CPA committee. It's on the town website. Uh, it's Amherst CPA, uh, Facebook Amherst CPA, CPAC, excuse me. And, you know, we have that with the intent of just spreading the word. Uh, you know, I post the meetings every week and sometimes we put up photos of different projects. And actually, if somebody had an interest uh, in assisting with managing the Facebook page that could be helpful. Uh, Sarah Marshall uh, posted a lot of different project photos last cycle. Um, I don't know if anyone wishes to assist, but if they do let me know and I can add you as an editor, uh, it's easy enough to do. But the intent of it again is to just let everybody in the community know that we have this program out here, that there are dollars, they're community dollars, and they're intended for community projects and we want input from uh, members and to spread the word as wide and as far as we can. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we just uh, hang tight here for till our first presentation arrives. Do you want to do public comment or topics the chair? Some of the other things, maybe um, the shorter ones? I don't have any topics that I didn't anticipate other than what's on the agenda. Um, I want to not 
prevent the opportunity for public comment at a later point in time. Uh, we could open it up now, but I'd like to open up again after the meeting because it's on the agenda. Uh, yes, Tim. Okay, I was just raising my hand electronically. Uh, just uh, it might be helpful for particularly for some of the new members and just to reiterate, based on last meeting, my understanding was we had about 1.7 million funds available. And if we included the reserves, it would be 2.2 million. So that was kind of the range, right? Just to yep. confirm, that's what it was. And uh, there are requirements that we spend at least 10% of that total for historic preservation, for housing, and then for open space slash recreation. So for the applicants tonight under historic preservation, just to put our mindset together, uh, there's about 170 to about 220,000 at a minimum that we must spend. Um, and of course, the requests are higher than that. So I just wanted to make sure everybody, I found it helpful to just sort of understand that in terms of the ballpark. We may or may not have some debt expenditures that might cover some of that. You know, okay. Uh, hopefully, you know, when, when we come to that point, uh, Sonia will be able to uh, share us the exact numbers, uh, but thank you for bringing that up, Tim, because we do have four different categories. Right. Uh, Michelle? Yeah. Um, just real quickly, I'm, I'm curious about the reserve. I, I asked a little bit before, but um, so it's for off-cycle um, proposals. So just because I'm, I'm new here, I'm not familiar with the cycle, but there are things that may happen in the summer or something that would get CPA funding, or what is that generally allocated for? Um, yes, we set that aside so that after the tax rates is set, we can't um, appropriate money on estimated revenues anymore once the tax rate is set, and that was just set today. So after today, only... Um, Excuse me, my phone keeps ringing. So after today, we can only use that. We can only budget, uh, appropriate from that budgeted reserve because we appropriated it, it's available to us. Otherwise, we would have had to um, have to use um, borrowing authorizations. So essentially, each uh, the the reserves are available for any time during this cycle. Even, this cycle, even at this time. June. Through June 30th, yes. Of next, of uh, 2023. So would they be yes. used for a new project or some over budget cost from the projects that we approve? No, it has to be, this? it would be a new project or additional okay. funds that you approve. You'd still have to go through this whole process to add money to a budget that, that wasn't enough. You would still have to go through the whole process. So new proposals come in through the year then? We don't, we don't normally, we only go through the proposal process once a year, but sometimes projects come up during the year that become an emergency that need, um, that need funding right away, maybe to um, access grant funding. I see, got it. So that, so then we would, we would bring the committee together again and go through the same process again. Did we use any of the surplus for either Kendrick Park or the track, or were those both just uh, debt and not touching the surplus? Kendrick Park, I believe, was debt, and so was so was the track. But we could have, if we had wished, used it. So it is within. If we had, I think at that time we didn't have a budget of reserve, so that our only avenue was borrowing. Uh, we just started budgeting this reserve like maybe one or two years ago. Matt. Yeah, I sort of have a related question. The proposals that we're working on what we're, we're hearing about right now that we're voting on right now they wouldn't receive money until july of 23 is that right correct okay so um the his the the painting one the mabel loomis todd painting one i think they want the money sooner it would i didn't realize that but they wouldn't okay. it wouldn't be available until july one Right, unless yeah. we voted it as a separate thing 
out of the budget of reserve. Out of the budget of reserve as a fiscal year 23, I got to remember my fiscal years as a fiscal year 23 project, because what we're voting on now is fiscal year 24 projects. Right. I, okay. Thank I have you. a question. I see your hand, Andy, but before that, um, I have the name of uh, Ben for the first presenter, uh, according to the schedule, the CPA funded projects, preservation restrictions. I see three individuals. Uh, as attendees, but not he. Do you know, Sonia, if there's somebody else here who might be the presenter? Well, Ben Breyer left. He's no longer with the town. He, he oh. left last Wednesday, so it was supposed to okay. be Dave Zomek. Okay. So let me text him and see. That's good to know. I'm not, not good that he's left. It's yeah, good to it was, know that have that information. I didn't know that until last week either. Wow. He's uh, he took another job with the Department of Transportation. Ah, uh, well, congratulations to him, I guess. Um, <clears throat> while we're still waiting, since we don't know what's going on with the first presentation, uh, Andy, I see you're having your hand up. Thanks, Sam. I had one other and kind of Tim's spirit of sharing learnings from years past. Maybe Sonia, you can help uh, me get this straight. But I know that as we talked about some of the housing projects, and I think uh, Diane alluded to this last year, that there's a multiplier effect. Um, um, the, the sort of the multiplier effect that was referred to by um, Diane last week for the East Street and Belchtown Road. I know that. Um, Mr. Hornick has referenced that in years past as well, but if you are comfortable, could you sort of share with the with the um, the committee here what that multiplier means and what projects that would impact? Um, I'm not comfortable. I'm not. Okay. Sam, do you or, or anyone from I, the committee last year may have a... Uh, I don't. My thought was that he was saying that the funds that they use are kind of seed money and that they partner with others to then multiply it. But I think that's a worthwhile question that we should pose to uh, the I mean, John whichever applicant you're referencing. It was John, I think, referring well, to... He would, he's the one who mentioned the past. I thought he'd said like an 8x multiplier or something, right? Just uh, Just sharing how you know, for our consideration, certain projects would actually be eligible for for that uh, that multiplier. We doesn't can it, check, we can check the history of the meetings because they're recorded. Uh, we can also inquire. It's worth doing. My understanding was that it was by virtue of partnering with others that they uh, bring in more money, but I could be incorrect. So it's a worthwhile question. Yeah, Andy, were you referring to the fact that the state expects a local contribution or are you referring to something else? So it's, um, they may be tied into that. So it may be with that contribution, with that show of good faith that they'll kick that money in. Uh, honestly, Matt, I don't recall enough. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine that the CPA would um, wholly fund the construction of of a, oh, yeah. of a large housing project right and she yeah i mean she'd mentioned the uh i would think the cpa would only be providing a certain local contribution or seed contribution for, for something like that yeah she had said last week there's basically 1.8 million dollar would turn into 21 and a half after the multiplier yeah so I, I'm sorry. I just heard from Dave Zomick. He's stuck in another meeting, so he asked us to move on. Yep. So he he was uh, presenting the two for Ben Breger. Yep. So can we move on to the uh, five paintings by Mabel Loomis Todd? I see. I saw. Thought I saw Gigi in the audience. Are, are you indicating that um, Robin was not presenting the historic barn and outbuilding? Well, we we're trying to figure out whether that was a conflict of interest since she is on the CPA committee. It depends on her to right. use herself. And we can't, we haven't got a clear answer on that. So was she, she's currently, was she currently scheduled to present though? That was my understanding. You're, you're Brent, saying that somebody Ben different? Breger was supposed to. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, Okay, uh, so <laughs> over two. Um, yeah, K Katie, I saw your hand up there. I just uh, wanted to get one 
final clarification because Michelle made me question this, which is the reserve can be used this year should we vote for that for, <coughs> for these projects that we're looking at right now. If, if you choose to put this in the balance that's available for fiscal year 24, it will no longer be available for fiscal year 23. Right, that's, right. That's, 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 I just wanted to clarify that we have mm -hmm. the choice to spend it all, distribute it all, uh, allocate it all now, then we wouldn't have anything if something came up in the spring, winter, spring. Right. Or we could save it in case something comes up, but that's the question I think for the committee at some point not yes. too far from now, but I just wanted to clarify because that's what I thought. It didn't have to be used um, off cycle. It could be put into this cycle. It could be put into this cycle, yes. Yeah, got it. Or a portion of it, right? I mean, we could we could use half of it. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. So um, apparently our first two presenters are, they're not, it's not likely to occur. Did you say Dave is in traffic or not able to present at all this evening? Would he he be is able to stuck at a meeting. He said yeah. to move on to the next presenter okay. Okay. and he'll get here as soon as he can. Oh, that sounds fine. So, um, you know, if, if uh, the five paintings, Mabel Lewis, Tom, I do see Gigi in the meeting, if she's ready, uh, that would be fine to start. Uh, I certainly don't want to uh, obligate someone to present in advance of their scheduled time uh, if they're not ready. But if she is ready, uh, uh, I see a hand up for Gigi. Uh, how can we uh, get her to communicate with us here? I am going to let her in. Hold on. There she is. Can you hear us? Yes. Gigi. Okay. You want, uh, you want to see me? Let me see what I can do. Uh, that's your your privilege to determine. I like to see people. <laughs> Hello. Uh, your face is familiar. Yep. Um, Someone so, had a question. Yes, Tim. Yep. Um, I need to, uh, I declare I'm not, this is not a conflict of interest because I'm no longer, but I am a former trustee of the uh, History Museum and Historic Society. So I'm no longer in that capacity, but I was at one point just for public disclosure. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we, I don't know if you've been listening. I assume you have, Gigi. We have our first two presenters delayed based on a right. change in staffing for the town. Uh, you're I'm welcome. glad I came down from supper early. <laughs> yes. If if you're ready, I'm ready. Uh, yeah, we would be fine. glad to welcome you uh, and uh, allow you to proceed. If you happen to need more time, uh, we'd be welcome to delay. But uh, given that you said you're ready, the floor is yours. OK, thank you all for reading the proposal that the Amherst Historical Society presented and for your questions, which I hope I've answered to your satisfaction. If not, we can go over those later. In the proposal itself, I focused on the physical condition of the paintings and the need to restore them both for the coming exhibition at the Historical Society, as well as for their future survival. Missing from the proposal was some of the contextual information that you might find of interest and importance. So that's what I'll be talking about right now. Uh, Mabel Loomis Todd, who was she? I think we all know something about her, but she was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1856. Her father was an astronomer, mathematician, and naturalist. And her mother was descended from John Alden of Plymouth County. Uh, so both parents actually had uh, colonial backgrounds. Um, she was educated at the Boston South End School for Young Ladies, not, not atypical, Georgetown Female Seminary in Washington, DC, where her parents moved in the 1870s, and then at the New England Conservatory of Music in 1874 and 75. It's been proposed that she studied with Martin Johnson Heed, a prominent landscape artist and painter of luscious tropical plants. However, Mabel was largely self-taught 
and painted local flowers, weeds, vegetables, wildflowers, and occasionally birds and butterflies, both in oil and watercolors. By 1879, she felt sufficiently accomplished to write a book on painting wildflowers in oil, but it was never published. After she married David Todd, he built a studio for her artistic endeavors in Washington where they lived right after their marriage. And then later he built another studio for her or made room for it in his office quarters at Amherst College. She gave lessons to local amateurs and painted um, multi-part screens, plaques, ceramics, and other objects that served as gifts, and she may have sold some as well. We cannot ignore the relationship of Mabel Loomis Todd to the family of Emily Dickinson, both during the life of the poet and afterwards. Mabel Todd had, as we all know, a longstanding relationship uh, with Emily's brother, Austin, but uh, that helped her become, become a, sort of an intimate of Emily and her sister Lavinia. And of course, eventually Mabel was one of the editors of the writer's poetry. The relationship between the two women, however, was um, an odd one. They never met face to face, but it was close enough that Mabel apparently loaned uh, one of the paintings that we want to have restored, uh, the painting of the hollyhocks, to Emily in 1885, as noted in a letter from Emily to Mabel. Also evident in her letters to her lover, Austin, was the importance of painting to her emotional state. At the end of one fraught letter to him, Mabel notes that she will, quote, get up and go out, pick some white roses to paint, perhaps. So flowers played an important role in her life, both as the subject of her artistic endeavors and in maintaining her own emotional equilibrium. Evident at the Dickinson Museum is Emily's own interest in flowers and gardening. That interest is of course also found in her poetry. In the library of the museum is a copy of a book presented to Emily by her father in 1859. Clarissa Badger's Wildflowers contains poetry and hand-colored lithographs of flowers that Emily would have known and that she later featured in her poetry. One of the paintings of apples um, by Mabel Loomis Todd also reflects a major agricultural crop in the valley. Other paintings by her include depictions of tobacco, corn, and, scot and squash, other important uh, crops. Paintings of flowers represent the local interest in horticulture that continues to this day. The paintings will be the centerpiece of a new exhibition that has been curated by Diana Lempel, a guest curator at the Historical Society this past summer. They will be accompanied by a selection of artifacts given to the Historical Society by Mabel, who traveled widely with her husband to South America, Russia, and Asia. As Diana has written, and I quote, this exhibition explores Mabel Loomis Todd, founder of the Amherst Historical Society, through her botanical artwork, nature writing, and efforts in historic preservation. She committed herself to land conservation in the Amherst area, as well as in Florida and coastal Maine. She painted weeds and local plants. She wrote about the sunsets from her Amherst home and savored every moment of her wild life. This exhibition calls us to be moved by Mabel's unabashed enthusiasm, unbridled love, and unquestionable unquenchable activity for seeing beauty in the world. Finally, we should not ignore Mabel's role in civic life. She was a founder of the Mary Mattoon chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Amherst Wo Woman's Club, as well as the Historical Society. She was an advocate of the landscape architect, Frederick Law Olmsted, whom Austin Dickinson wanted to advise the town and Amherst College on landscaping matters. And in fact, um, the impact of that relationship still exists. Intellectually, she was accomplished. She was a fine musician. She wrote or edited a dozen books on literature, astronomy, and travel, as well as edited Emily Dickinson's poetry. In short, she was an important local figure and her paintings are certainly deserving of recognition and preservation. And are there any questions? 
Oh dear. Well, I, I took the time to go to the uh, museum to see the paintings. Oh, uh, they they were uh, quite impressive. I, for some reason, I thought there were three, but there are five. They're certainly quite right. colorful. Uh, I have to say that upper room there is kind of like mm -hmm. going into somebody's attic. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's, which is always always fun to explore. Uh, right. it's, it's I had never in all my years actually entered that building, even though I've been in Amherst most of my life. Yeah, uh, we're going to try when we open up in the spring. It's evident that we have a lot of work to do to get the community into our building. And I think one of the things we'll try to do is to invite groups of people, whether it's a church group or members of town government, um, other social organizations. We just need to get people in. And the Mabel Loomis Todd exhibition will be the major one next summer. Yeah, so no, it's it's a great that. building with cool things to look at. And I saw the um, Bridges family exhibit. Some of those people uh, in mm -hmm. the photos grew up down the, down there where, where I grew up in Amherst. It's it's really something to see for anyone who has not. Um, questions? I see Andy. I believe you had your hand up first. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Judy giving that extra context. Yeah. Um, so my question, and apologies if I, if I missed an email or I'm looking at an out-of-date file, but um, what I'm looking at says you're requesting 16,450, which looks like the cost from your estimate just to restore hollyhocks. No, um, that's, no. no, that's the total of all the paintings. Okay, the individual sheets talk about, okay, they, the, I mean, I looked through them again, today and I think that okay um all right that was my question thanks oh I see what you mean yeah right above the painting it's only, it says total estimated cost but that's the total for all of them yeah that's that's what it is thanks for clarifying yeah, that would be very pricey <laughs> uh, Matt yeah I have two very short questions so um the exhibition is in summer of 23 is that correct Right. Yeah. So as I suspected, this is actually an off cycle request because but it's not not a big deal. Um, so you need the money like now, basically. Or, well, or sp soon before spring. If we could, that would be fabulous. Yes. But before I, spring, by by early spring at the latest. Well, we can phase them in. Um, Michelson's gallery. No. Well, I've told them that we can't start work on them until July 1st. And that oh, okay. as soon as and as soon as I hear that we have the funds, he will commit as much time as possible to working on these. Okay. Um, and but a couple could, of them if we could get you the money off cycle earlier, that would be better for you. Oh, it'd be fabulous. Right. I okay. My second my second question is um uh has the has the Museum been open since COVID? Yes. Or is this like oh okay. But this is kind it's of like it's been open all summer. Okay. But but this is sort of part of a, a as you sort of alluded to, a sort of a relaunch to increase um attention in the museum and interest in the museum. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We had um a visiting curator last summer, Diana Lampel. Um I've been in the research library museum world for decades, and she is just singular in her intelligence, um, ceaseless good ideas, her commitment to community outreach. And she's really turned the board into a very different direction than it was following, let's say, five years ago. And um, we're going to be trying. We're trying to be very active in our efforts. Um, we want to try to bring back visits from school children. Um, any of you who grew up in Amherst probably visited the museum when you were in third or fifth grade or something. Um, and those visits stopped largely because of busing costs and other issues. But we're we're really pretty committed to reinvigorating that program. Um, and as I say, just being 
you know, more open, trying to get a larger volunteer base to keep the museum open more hours per week. Right now we're a very small board and we have no paid staff, so it's pretty difficult, but we're working on it. <laughs> it's, cer it's certainly a, a wonderful location, very yeah. easily accessible. Uh, to follow up on Matt's question, um, if I heard you correctly, there's some flexibility with Michelson Galleries regarding your payment time period, even if it's after July, uh, that as long as they know, at my assumption, uh, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, as long as they know the funds are coming, they're able to proceed, although you would much prefer earlier if possible. Oh dear, this past fall, I, uh, Ben Breger, um made it, we, we started working on a current project without a signed contract. And my understanding is that I can't get a sign, can't get a contract until July 1st. Now, I, I leave this up to you. I mean, if- Contract with the town or contract with- Contract with the town. Okay. So, which is I something see. kind of new. I mean, I used to be the board chair and presented to other CPAC committees and I, I'd never heard about contracts. <laughs> I was clueless. Um, so, it, if, does that sound right to you, Sonia? Yeah, it's um, it's not really a it's a grant agreement. Yeah, it's an agreement between the grantee and the town, uh, stating that you agree to all the restrictions that that will be put on this when you accept the money that you and other and whatever specific to the projects. So right. it's it's not a huge contract, but it's, it's probably a one or is but the contract would not necessarily be time dependent that is say the contract could be signed even though the funds may be uh processed at a later date is that correct well if, we, if we're talking about fiscal year 24 it's fiscal right. year 24 so but it starts July. Could be, could be signed prior to fiscal year 24 they can get it ready yes well, that would be great. I mean, I'm sure Michelson's would, you know, be happy to start in May and wait until July for payment. You can't start the work. Well, it depends. That's for fiscal year 24, you cannot start the work before July 1st. If you if you do part of the work in June, we will not be able to reimburse you for that work. Okay. That's my understanding. Right. So it really doesn't matter unless we do it off cycle, as Matt was uh, suggesting. Yeah. Okay. I think well, if I, you can do it off cycle, or if you could use funds that are held over from this year, maybe that would work. Yeah, that's what we mean by off cycle. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I I guess I have a question. Uh, we received, and Robin, you might be able to assist with this. We received the letters today from the uh, Amherst Historical Commission uh, regarding the different projects. Mm -hmm. um, and this one also received a letter uh, from the chair of the historical commission, uh, strongly in favor of it. But I'm curious, are, are these and or any, you know, are these recognized in the Massachusetts Historical Society of any, you know, is there any like formal recognition that occurs with paintings such as these? I think that the, um, the, Paintings would not be part of uh, the system called MACRIFs, which is buildings, structures, and objects. Those are think, all external uh, items. But um, the requirement for CPA is simply that the Historical Commission confirm that they are a significant historical resource of the town. And we've done that with. Um, uh, in the case of the Jones Library, the significant historical resource there is the archives themselves, the materials in the archives. So it's uh, perfectly in line with CPA standards. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, kind of a nonsensical question. Do you have a favorite painting of the five? <laughs> I love the hollyhocks. <laughs> the hollyhocks? Yeah. And, and the fact that I don't know. Research is a funny thing. And um, Diana Lempel had read um, the book on Mabel and Austin. 
And she noted in one of her texts for the, for the, for the painting that it had been on loan to um, Emily Dickinson. And I thought, wow, that's, that's just incredible. And I thought, well, I better verify this because that's what I do. So I open up the book by Polly Longsworth on Mabel and Austin. And I literally opened up to the page mentioning that painting. So that's my favorite painting. It's so easy. The, the, um, I, one other question. I, I looked at them and I saw different degrees of uh, work needed on them. Some seem yeah. to have some, some damage on the primary portion of the paintings. Uh, do you, right. Do you, can you describe how they might repair uh, well, something like that? Yeah, the, the painting that's in the worst condition is the, um, the, the long horizontal panel of the iris. But the part that's badly damaged is the lower portion. And they can do some in-painting. They use a water-soluble paint in case anybody wants to remove it. And um, it'll, I mean, that's, you know, it'll work out very nicely. If that had been a portion of the painting that had a lot of little details or, you know, figures or um, small things, then it would be very difficult. The other one that looks in terrible shape is the wisteria. And that's kind of fun because we've got a beautiful wisteria plant at the Historical Society. And that, the surface on that is just simply really dirty, according to the conservator at Michelson's galleries. So that'll clean up very nicely. Um, I had just a little tiny bit of training in painting conservation, and it's amazing what even just a little touch of water and a little bit of special detergent, don't use your ivory or dawn on it, but um, it's amazing what, you know, just very minute um, uh, solvents can do um, getting, getting surface paint off. That one I thought was beyond repair, but he said no. They'll make it look nice again. But yeah, they're quite varied. Any additional questions or comments from uh, committee members? Yeah, you, you might wonder why we didn't get multiple quotes and bids. Um, but frankly, the paintings are so fragile that um, traveling across the Commonwealth from Boston to Williamstown didn't make sense. And the Williamstown Art Conservation Center is the finest in the Northeast. But had we had them do condition reports and estimates, and if we didn't get funding, we'd be liable for several thousand dollars. <laughs> and we just couldn't take that chance. But Michelson's will do a good job. And they've done other paintings owned by the Historical Society. So. They're certainly vibrant in color, um, yeah, and, and they're large. Yes, yes. So um, I don't think there are any other uh, questions or uh, comments from the panel. If you have any uh, last comments yourself, you should be glad. No, to I think I've otherwise. said enough. <laughs> I've had more than my share of time. Thank you to the other people who couldn't appear yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, great. Uh, thank you so much for okay. taking the time to explain the proposal further to yeah. us. Well, and thank you all for taking so much time out of your lives. I know it's a lot of work and effort, so good luck. Uh, thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. So um, I don't know if this next presenter is ready or not, since we are ahead of schedule. Uh, <clears throat> The next one in our cycle, which is scheduled for seven o'clock, would be the Dickinson Farmhouse Roof and Restoration. I do see Rebecca Frick in the audience, although um, I don't know if you're hearing us or not, Rebecca. Um, I'm promoter now. Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Um, would you be able to present at this time, or do you need a little bit more time? Can you hear us? I 
cannot hear Rebecca. I okay. Hear. When I was invited in, you all disappeared for a few seconds. So here I am. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So, Hello. Uh, would would this time work for you? Yes, okay. I, I got on early and saw Gigi and then I thought, oh, oh no. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> well, the, the option's yours, but uh, I see a hand up, Robin, is that correct? Yeah, just, um, and I, I just want to apologize to everybody. Um, my historical commission meetings were always at 6.30. So I was perfectly on time for the historical commission, but I was late for this meeting, so my apologies. Um, Madeline Helmer is going to be the presenter uh, for the Barnes proposal, and she is here. So I just wanted to okay. put, put that out there. Okay. Um, well, we have uh, invited uh, Rebecca to present, so I say let's stay with that, and then we can uh, consider adjusting thereafter. Uh, so the, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I should have asked this ahead of time. Would it be helpful for it, me to share my slides? I think you've seen them. How, how would you like to do this? Whatever you feel is best. Okay. You're, well, you're, you decide. I'll, I'll uh, put the slides up because I assume it's not just you watching this. And um, first, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. I know you have some tough decisions coming up this year. Um, let's see, can I share my screen? I think so. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the Dickinson Farmhouse is on the grounds of Wildwood Cemetery and we're at 70 Strong Street. You can see it's a very large parcel. Um, we actually have two different parcels and the cemetery office is in the Dickinson Farmhouse um, and has been there for a, a very long time. Um, it's sort of nice that we followed the Amherst Historical Society because the names are all, all uh, similar. Um, Austin Dickinson was one of the major people to set the cemetery up. He saw that West Cemetery was filling up and he and what I call the street name families, worked on purchasing this land. And at some point, pretty quickly, he uh, convinced his cousin, Fidelia Dickinson, who was married to his cousin, to donate the house. And the house, we think, was built in the late 1700s, 1790s. Um, okay. So, uh, we consider Wildwood a, a local historic resource. Um, we have some century trees, quite a few, that we're trying to keep healthy and providing shade. We have monuments of all shapes and sizes uh, representing native stone materials and non-native. Um, and we have quite a few notable people, and I say that um, with, uh, I, I'm a little hesitant to say that because I think everybody's notable, but there are a lot of uh, very important people who are buried at Wildwood. And um, we have been a non-denominational welcoming place from the start. What happened was that, so Austin saw the West Cemetery filling up and he said, let's do this. And he tried to get Frederick Law Olmsted to help with the planning of the cemetery. And Olmsted wrote back and said, I'm too busy, I'm sorry, but here are my, my uh, latest articles on the rural cemetery movement. And he provided a long list of native plants that he recommended. And he had very definite opinions about how the monuments should be. And as with a lot of Olmsted's projects, uh, the people in Amher sort of took what they wanted and uh, didn't pay attention to the, some of his other ideas. Um, but the uh, Olmsted firm came back, well, came about 10 years later to see the grounds. And I have that report um, in my files. So what's happening with this house, um, as you can, if, if I know that some of you visited, 
it has been worked on over the years. You know, we have new windows, um, we have a uh, um, wheelchair accessible ramp on the back. Um, the roof has been replaced multiple times right now. There's a tin roof on um, and the chimney and the mortar is, all of that needs attention. Um, when I met with the historical society, they, they said, well, that's a very large number you're coming to us with. And they suggested that I break the project up. So I, for this ask, I am asking for the roof and the chimneys. And I know some, some of you asked if we could break it down further. And so if that would be the case, then I would just ask for the roof. We should start there and then we can do the, the brick and mortar at, um, at a later date. And we did ask for, um, we asked a few companies to come. We chose one that was super um, responsive and they do this composite slate that looks very similar to the tin roof that we have and could actually be the modern day equivalent of what was underneath. We're not sure what was what was originally used. It could have been shake, cedar shake or, or slate. Um, we do intend, we do hope to do a snow retention system and um, the crown molding needs to be replaced. Right now, I have a woodpecker <laughs> who's managed to make quite the hole in the molding um, that we just replaced with wood. So we're talking about using uh, composite material. Um, whoops. I don't want that, sorry. Um, there we go. Here's some pictures. Um, we did have new insulation put in uh, because the building is extremely drafty and we were hoping to help the upstairs apartment. Um, and the insulation that we did have there was disgusting. Um, so we did put in new insulation and we put in some new flooring so we could walk over the, the thick um, layer of insulation. And in the process, we really, we found these cracks around the chimneys and um, leaking happening along the, the walls. And you've seen the budget. Um, in this budget, we do have the masonry and the roof combined. And the thought was that we could use the staging for both projects. And Wildwood does operate uh, for such a large place. We do operate on a pretty limited budget. Um, but we thought we could put in 5%. And we have um, a renewed commitment to building our, our buildings. We're building a new garage, which is a huge project. Um, and we're trying to do a lot of deferred maintenance. And the, we've been doing that for the past three years. We're in the process of setting up a 501c3. And um, we've been doing green burials uh, since 2014. And I would like to expand that idea and we're hoping to put in more pollinator friendly landscaping. And um, we're really encouraging the public to come and use the grounds for quiet recreation and, and walks. It's a pretty safe place to walk. Um, we do have an outer trail that runs about three miles that hooks up with town conservation land. We have birders coming through. We have the cross country running team from the high school. We have the preschool from uh, right next to Wildwood. We have Wildwood uh, school classes coming over to the pond area. And I, first, I, I hope that in the near future, we will start doing some public historic and environmental programming for people. So that I'll stop sharing and take your questions. There's anyone in the committee I see. Uh, Michelle, your hand is up. Sorry if this was in all the information packets. I was wondering if all four chimneys were functional still. They're, they've all, all the fireplaces have been boarded up. Um, 
there's one that was open when I was hired and they sealed that up because it was just <laughs> an empty, you know, open space to the sky. Um, but the, as I said, this building has been used um, for as the office and it has the apartment upstairs. So it has been, it has been changed a lot from the original way it was being used. So no, we do have to keep them though, the right height. Um, that's just, we, the, I think the option is to either take them off completely or keep them at the height of, I forget how many feet over the roof, which we intend to do to maintain the look. Katie? Rebecca, thank you so much. I appreciate the presentation and the um, proposal itself. Um, I did have a question. You responded to all of our questions, which thank you very much. Um, but I wasn't sure, and maybe you're, I don't know if it's Sonia or someone else to answer this. Um, and if I missed it, I, I apologize, but it was about the removal of chimneys being in compliance with CPA requirements or, you know, adjustments to chimneys. And so I didn't know, I, I, I'm I'm just wanting to get understanding. I, I understand the need for all of the, what you've described, but I wasn't sure about how it applies to our CPA requirements because I don't know those well enough. Um, so Robin, you might answer or Sonia. Um, yeah, that was actually my question. Oh. Um, it has to do with the, um, the secretary, the CPA, um, legislation requires, um, alignment with the secretary of the interior standards for preservation and rehabilitation. And, uh, there are 10 standards, um, I've been studying them in school. Um, one of the requirements is that um, all original materials, um, if they can be be repaired or be reused, um, uh, should be should not be replaced with new material. So that was my that was my it was more a question. Um, and this gets to the issue of the roof material as well. Um, it, I, I'm not uh, yet a preservation consultant who could speak on these issues, but I know that. Um, I'm not sure how the town is um, working to set up. Uh, the confirmation of just that requirement, but that was just um, a question related to that to make sure. Basically, um, the scope of the scope of work needs to be reviewed by somebody familiar with familiar enough with the standards um, and in a professional capacity to make sure that there's no work being done that uh, doesn't align with them. So that was that was the nature of my question. Does that answer your question, Katie? Well, it sounds like it's a still an outstanding question to be answered. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it's an outstanding question for the town. So I'll just hand it over to Sonia if she wants to address it or we can discuss it later. Um, yeah, I'm not the expert on that either. I always refer to the coalition, to the CPA coalition or to the Department of Revenue. So we can do that. Somebody did ask me about this roof, and I think it is the exact same style that the Jones Library is going to be using because it looks, you know, it looks right. <laughs> and in terms of the bricks, I think the, the mason we chose was um, very, uh, he was very proud of, of reusing as much of the material as possible and doing the masonry exactly like it had been done. He was really impressed with the way, I, I mean, he was going into so much detail. It was pretty cool to hear how the bricks are layered inside and and facing okay. in different directions. So I think he's okay. quite confident. Great, thank you. I just, I just wanna clarify that I don't believe um, as of this point that the Jones Library is using CPA funding for their roofing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanna, um, that. So, uh, Rebecca, thank you uh, for presentation information uh, and for submitting a proposal. Um, and I know you alluded to what you think might have been the roof uh, materials initially. I'm wondering if anyone has actually sought to thoroughly research that to try and identify what yeah. was there at the time. Were there any photos? Uh, uh, you know, might there be some location where something could be found? Uh, um, I have most of the photos and I don't, 
um, I would have to go through them again. I don't think I have any from those early, you know, as early as you can get. Um, the tin is obviously not the original um, and it has, uh, it might just not have any of the older stuff because the the boards that you can see on the attic, inside the attic are the original ones. And then you have like bad plywood above that. And then the tin. Um, another question I have for you is, uh, there's been reference to the uh, new maintenance building that's being built. And I'm wondering how uh, the uh, group decided to prioritize the maintenance building over the existing roof. Yeah, um, that we have needed a garage since I think about 1950, it was first mentioned in the cemetery reports. Um, we are doing uh, more business than we used to. And our ground superintendent is on site now, you know, 40 hours a week or more probably. Um, and his, his space, his office space is in the basement. And if you want a exhibit on mold, you come to our basement, it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> um, it was really inhumane to have people down there and also our equipment you know, any electronic equipment stored down there, uh, it was not going to last. And when I came on board four years ago, I just said, all right, we have to do this, you know. Um, and also we have more of the digging equipment because we are an operating cemetery on site. Um, we used to contract out and now we have all of those um, big pieces of equipment that are sitting outside. Um, we are also doing more burials than ever before, and that and we do burials um, all year round. And uh, it gets very tricky in the winter because if you dig a grave and you have the soil sitting in the pickup in the truck, it freezes. So now we can put it into uh, the garage and not have that issue. We could keep it at garage temperature. So there were a lot of different um, reasons why we had to do that first. But, but the roof is leaking currently? It's We've sealed it up with uh, caulk, but it's not a permanent situation. It's not a good permanent situation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Robin, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just um, wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that you might be able to, if, if absolutely necessary, you might be able to split the project into two phases. Do you know what impact that would have on the total cost? He, the, well, the roofer said that it wasn't going to change his his cost, and okay. I didn't I didn't ask the mason because then we're talking about you know two years from now instead of the okay. next year. Yeah. No, but no ballpark for if what what extra it would. I mean, no, because he even. I mean, the roofer said. You know, we're at 9% inflation right now. Um, right, right. I mean, I like, just don't know if it's, you know, a $5,000 or $15,000. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I could find that out. Although yeah, I think they would be, be hesitant helpful, to tell yeah. me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, well, just yeah. because we're so, we're now projecting into the future. Yep, um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's an issue that's rising and questions that we have for most all of our presenters, Rebecca, yeah. and we may yeah. in the future, uh, because we have requests that are significantly greater than the budgets that we have, and we may yeah. inquire of all uh, relating to um, can things be delayed and what could be done with the right, survey. Right, right. Uh, and that's a recurring theme that's, that exists here. Um, yeah. Do any committee members have any further comments or questions for Rebecca at this time? We may have questions at a later point that we would email. Yeah, um, that's fine. And do you have any, uh, Matt? Yeah, I just wanted to just make the point. In the Mason's uh, quote, there was a $15,000 quote for removing the chimneys altogether. So, um, but I guess it's still outstanding as to like, what whether that would would qualify for CPA funding or not? Yeah, and we really don't want to remove the chimneys. 
So Why? Just because it's, you know, it's that, the, the look that it's had since the beginning. Um, okay. But so many yeah. things have changed. Yes, that's true. That's true. It's hard to hold the line there. <laughs> Robin? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can say that uh, removing the trim chimneys absolutely would, would be not be in alignment with the secretary's standards to remove okay. uh, historical material that's existing uh, is a big no-no. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. Um, do you have any uh, further comments for, for us, uh, Rebecca? No, just thank you all. You have some really tough decisions ahead. It's a big year. I was shocked when I saw how many of the projects were were here. So good luck and uh, thank you. So um, just remind me of the process going forward. We will continue to hear all of the presentations. Uh, we have more scheduled for next week. Uh, thereafter, the committee will begin to deliberate uh, based on various criteria. Uh, and at some point, as we go, uh, you know, week to week, we will arrive at what we will determine to be a slate uh, okay. for funding, and we will then uh, have votes upon that, uh, generate presentations, and present it to the town council. Uh, anything that we don't approve, the town council can't grant funds for, but whatever we approve, uh, we are recommending it to the town mm -hmm. council, and then they must actually authorize the funding. Once the fundings, uh, once the uh, granting of the awards are approved, then there's a contracting process that uh, Sonia and others might know more about than uh, we would on the committee. Uh, and the cycle for the uh, award is based on the fiscal year that's associated with. So our determination process will be occurring, uh, I expect, over the course of the the next month, but okay. we may have some questions for you and other uh, presenters, uh, depending on uh, what the committee uh, comes okay. up with. All right. So, would it? I guess my next question is: Would it be helpful if I found out how much the staging is, so that I know, you know, how much we would be saving if we combined the roof and the masonry? Any information uh, would be helpful. Uh, okay. because more information is better than less, particularly if it's specific to something we were inquiring about. Okay, all right. And you're, you're welcome to provide it right up to the time that we're voting, although the sooner the better. Okay, all right, good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. Thank, -bye. Right. Thank you, now. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. So, uh, Robin, uh, there was a, uh, a question or a comment in the chat that uh, Madeline did indicate she was ready to present. Um, and since that presentation was scheduled for earlier, uh, she indicated she was ready at the 6.30 timeframe. We didn't realize that she would have been the individual. So I think that uh, your comment and suggestion to have her present now makes sense, given that the uh, Preserving Zion Church is 7.15. So we, you know, Madeline has been waiting longer. So if you're able, Sonia, to uh, bring Madeline in, Madeline, hopefully you can hear us. Um, and we'd be glad to listen. Hi, thanks for bringing uh, me in. <laughs> hi, we can hear you. Hopefully you can hear us. Yes. Uh, thank you for your patience as we uh, flex the schedule uh, at this time. Oh, no, no, um, no worries. We'd be glad to hear uh, your presentation and the floor is yours. Yes, okay, so my name is Madeline Helmer. I am presenting on behalf of the Historical Commission for uh, funding to create a historic barn and outbuilding assessment program. Um, so I'm just going to present a brief overview of the proposal which you've received, and then I'll provide some additional details. Uh, so this program would provide small grants to help uh, with conditions assessments for historic barns and outbuildings in Amherst. 
the grant would offset the cost of hiring a qualified contractor to evaluate the condition of a historic barn and make recommendations for its care. The qualified contractor would prepare a report that prioritizes repairs and gives uh, rough cost estimates. Um, so with this information, owners can make informed decisions about their building's repairs, um, whether they can preserve or um, apply for funding um, the building. And the conditions assessment would also serve as a public document, a record of the building that could be housed um, in a public online system such as MACRIS, which is uh, Massachusetts State Historic Preservation Office's online system. And this recordation would also be useful to the Historical Commission if um, they're faced with requests for demolition, just to know what the issues are and what are the hurdles that need to be crossed. Um, so Amherst barns and outbuildings are abundant, but they are at risk. Since 2017, the Historical Commission has received 21 requests for demolition of historic outbuildings and barns. Um, Vermont and New Hampshire have uh, programs for this type of grant, but Massachusetts does not. Um, so it, there certainly is a need. Um, and just to address some details to answer questions that we've received, the Historical Commission would maintain a list of recommended qualified contractors um, just to uh, recommend to uh, private owners who are considering the program. And we propose a 50-50 matching program, and this is an adjustment to the proposal, um, uh, but we think that it would, it would maybe create more um, just a better partnership with a with a property owner and more of an incentive to um, find a find a contractor and and only approach the grant if if there's a, a real need um, but the uh, we anticipate that an assessment would cost approximately a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars so um, a match would be seven fifty, um, and it would be a first come first serve basis to avoid administrative burden and another application process, and to allow for funds to be distributed at any time of the year. And um, we were asked whether we had an estimate of the cost for rehabbing or stabilizing a barn, and that's just really hard to say. It's it's variable. Um, but this assessment could just allow an owner to make informed decisions regarding the building's future. Um, and the barn would not need to be visible from the right of way um, in this program, but um, we're considering that um, it would still um, be pertinent because the condition assessment would be provided as a record of the building um, that's available to the public and um, it would serve as a documentation of, of the resource. So that's all I have. I can answer questions. Tim. Yes, hi, uh, thank you very much. Hi. I have a question. Um, if a barn is considered historic by whatever criteria and whatever organization, can a owner just tear it down or, or could they be prohibited from tearing it down? So the um, recently updated bylaws um, in Amherst require that a building over 75 years old um, needs to have, um, needs to be brought forth to the Historical Commission, I believe, to um, be considered what, um, they need to consider whether it's a, a historically significant building. I'm all new to this, so <laughs> I'm okay. kind of fumbling with the language, but if I it's over 75. At any time if you need. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Robin. I just joined the Historical Commission a few months ago. So. Um, and Madeline is uh, doing us a favor by presenting this proposal, which um, I actually wrote on behalf of the Historical Commission. So since I'm on the committee, we thought it would be better for her to do the presentation. But in terms of um, demolition, yes. Uh, if there's a demolition request and the building is historically significant, then it would come before the Historical Commission and the Historical Commission would decide, uh, would have, hold a public hearing and then 
decide whether or not to impose something called a demolition delay of up to 12 months. Um, the Historical Commission does not have the power to prevent demolition uh, um, in perpetuity. Only with the, our biggest tool is a 12 month delay, but we sometimes impose delays to allow for other preservation efforts to come forward. Andy. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for uh, pinch hitting here, Madeline. Great job on the presentation. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. So you said 21 requests for demolitions in the past five years or so. Um, does, I guess, does anybody have a sense whether getting this assessment, so essentially maybe knowing how, how poor a condition your barn is, would actually help to save the barn? Right, because ultimately it's, that's the objective, right, is we want to use this to be able to save it. Um, does this actually help with that? And one of the reasons why I ask too is I noticed you you expected a matching uh, matching contribution, nominal matching contribution, but just um, you know they're essentially they'll get a, a a statement saying how bad it is, right, and how much it's going to cost. But uh, if they don't necessarily have access to funds or grants to repair it, um, I guess what what good will this end up serving? Well, I think um, so it sort of it creates kind of a, a clearer um, sort of understanding of what needs to be what needs to be done and what are the the costs um, and what are the sort of levels of intervention that you could do. Um, maybe what would it cost to just stabilize the structure, et cetera. Um, and I think that would allow perhaps, um, an application to further CPA funding or um, or other types of grants um, that are available for historic buildings. Okay, so maybe it's maybe the, the the barn owner thinks it's really bad. It's actually maybe not as bad as they think after getting the assessment, and it's perhaps a nominal enough money that they can go to CPAC. And or, I mean, these uh, are just these are often just buildings that are um, that are neglected and um, an owner doesn't really know where to start, you know, um, and it, sometimes it seems easier just to knock the thing down rather than really put some money into assessing um, the structural repairs. Um, so this would be to, to sort of make that more available. Okay, and then one other question, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but do you have a sense of how many historic barns there are in Amherst that might benefit from this program? Uh, what do you think, Robin? <laughs> so, so let's start looking for them. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> I see them. Um, I don't know whether I don't know whether it's a hundred or five hundred or oh, fifty. Uh, you know, oh, lots. It's, there, yeah, the, hundreds. Um, yeah, yeah. I would guess over at least over a hundred. Um, I mean, when I started driving around town, I mean, I couldn't stop to take the pictures for the proposal. I couldn't, I couldn't stop for all of them. It really is surprising. Um, um, I was just going to add a couple things. One is that um, I think I put in the proposal that um, we would structure the program to waive the fee for those coming before us for demolition purposes, uh, since there's already an incentive there to tear the building down. Um, we would want to uh, allow the program to fund a an assessment because in addition to um, assessing uh, repairs and stabilization and possible rehabilitation, um, it would also be, um, these are um, uh, timber framing experts who would be um, providing historical data on the building. Um, they, they'd write a report that would include information on the structure, um, generally when it was built, what it was used for, how it was modified over time. So um, there's sort of three different prongs, like that becomes um, this information that could be used to populate an in inventory form in MACRIS um, to update the historic inventory in MACRIS is a central responsibility of the Historical Commission. So that um, we're, we're promoting that effort by implementing this program. Um, and then it would be to get an assessment of a building that's facing demolition so that if it is demolished, we have a record of it. And then for 
property owners who have a building like this on their property who think that they might like to uh, to rehab it or stabilize it or repurpose it in some way, this would give them the first step going forward. And like Madeline said, um, they could conceivably apply for CPA funds after that. Um, there aren't really any historic preservation funds for private property owners, so that would be um, the only option. But some people might have their own funds too. But um, the idea would be to incentivize people with um, barns that are not falling down, or barns and outbuildings that are not falling down, but you know are, are there and um, they may have curiosity about them, and this would be an incentive for them to. Um, move that further so that if they wanted to repurpose the building, that uh, they'd, they'd be able to get some help making that first step. Is one super fast one also, Sam? Which I may have already you may have mentioned this, Madeline. Are we is historic greater than seventy five years? Is that mm -hmm. that's where you okay? Thanks, uh, Matt. Yeah, I'm just sort of uh, trying to understand a little bit more concrete what's going on here. Um, and maybe Robin is best to answer this question. So of the in the last in the proposal, it says in the last five years, there were 21 requests for demolition. I just want to understand um, what actually happened roughly to those 21 requests for demolition. And then if you had this program in place, what would be what do you anticipate would be different? Um, I uh, let's see, I should. I, uh... I think how many we did not put a demolition delay on any barn or outbuilding that I recall. Um, I know there was one on the University of Massachusetts uh, properties near the Renaissance Center. There was up one up near the on Route 63. Um, we, so you think you think basically <laughs> mo almost all of those did get demolished. Yeah, yep, yep. I think they okay. almost all got demolished. There were no assessments done on any of them. Okay. Um, so if this program was in place, what would you anticipate would have happened? Uh, the first thing would be that we would have offered, uh, or um, I, I think we would have the power to make a requirement within that 12 month period that an assessment be completed for any properties that we felt were particularly significant and that we wanted to document. Um, do you think that would have been half of them or um, less than half? I would say that they, I mean, a good number of them. There were, there were okay. definitely, uh, there were definitely some that we were pained to see demolished and we tried to find okay. um, ways to at least repurpose the materials and that sort of thing. Um, and then the other um, thing that um, I wanted to mention is that the Historical Commission paid for um, a, a survey that was completed by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission of outbuildings in Amherst, which uh, we have on file. And so that serves an, as an inventory for us to potentially contact those property owners to promote the program so that along with the, the buildings that come before us for demolition, we would be proactively reaching out to uh, property owners uh, to let them know about the program in case they were interested in participating. And a, a final question. Um, what, oh, I actually, I think it's answered, sorry. Okay. I was just gonna ask, what is your budget? Like you you have, Oh, sorry. No, that's that was not answered. So, what resources does the historical commission currently have? Do you have any resources? No. Uh, not for this purpose. No. Michelle, I was just wondering if you would consider prioritizing um, buildings that were visible from the right of way, just for, you know, prioritizing community um, enjoyment. And I, I understand that might bump up your administrative cost a bit, but that's my question. Um, I think uh, as I thought through this um, in writing the proposal, the reason that we that we want to develop this program is to have funds off cycle. If we went to a prioritizing um, 
by public view. I mean, we could exclude buildings that are not in the public view. That that would be an option. Um, but if we were to prioritize it, we would be in a situation where we would have to make it a grant cycle. We would have to get a bunch of applications. And then um, public view buildings would be prioritized and non-public view buildings would fall behind. That we're just trying to avoid that so that we can provide the funds when the interest is expressed and um, and make a program that's uh, quicker and more efficient. And this is, you know, this is really kind of the pilot um, for this idea, but the historical commission has been talking about it for a number of years now, particularly with the barns that, and outbuildings that have come before us that have been demolished. Uh, Michelle? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you've already finished your question. Katie? Um, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, th first of all, thank you, Madeline. And um, I just wanted to understand I think I understood that it was fifteen thousand dollars re requested for three a three year kind of pilot. Is that right? Right. So, for first of all, I like that addition of the fifty fifty split for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, between the homeowner and I'm just wondering if a pilot could be, say, six thousand dollars, which might get you, you know, six projects funded or some, you know, something or more um, with the 50-50 split if, and, and to sort of test out, is this, does it get a lot of traction? Is there a lot of interest? You had you, you know, did you have, you know, 20 people apply and then um, come back to the CPA for another, you know, with, with sort of a report on that? Would that be an option for you? Tell me a little bit more about why the three years and if, since we have so much money requested, if if a smaller amount could be piloted, yeah, that's certainly um, valid, and especially because there is such a demand for funding this year. Um, we have discussed that it could be possible to have a a lower amount, um, and we would still be able to um, implement the program. Um, just that we would need. Um, kind of to reach a, a certain number in order for us to to have a pilot program but um i think we were thinking 10,000 would it, we could drop it a little, just 5k to to do a 10k program if that's if that's necessary um and we would still be able to kind of have it be a working program Thank you. I just want to remind the committee we're running a bit over here. So if there are further questions, if we can try and keep them quick. Uh, Tim, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I should have uh, removed the hand. I had the same question okay. as Katie. So I, I have a quick question. If uh, the 50-50 split, that alludes to uh, the fees being for the appraisal being split between the applicants and the historical commission. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, and uh, I guess this might be for Robin. Uh, might this be considered administrative expenses? Is that um, the concept? That's since the we're town. Not... <laughs> okay, uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to identify. I know. I know. Uh, right. uh, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Qualification purposes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I floated we're not it. Not creating okay. anything, but we are. Yeah. Gaining yep. administrative purposes for the purposes of decision making. Yeah. Uh, it's a thought. Uh, yeah. No, I like actually that. I floated it as at the, as that at the um, at the historical commission, and um, Ben suggested that um, after talking, I think after talking to other staff, that I put in a proposal. So um, we're in favor of it either way. Yeah. So any other uh, immediate questions for the committee? Uh, we do have the opportunity to ask them at a later point in time. Uh, I don't see any any uh, final words from uh, uh, you, Madeline or Robin. No, none for me. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for patiently waiting in the audience. I appreciate it. Uh, our next uh, proposal is the Preserving Zion Church, North Amherst. Uh, Sonia, can you, uh, are you able to enter? I see uh, Si Kyung Pak, if I pronounce it correctly. I believe that's the individual. Let us know when you can uh, hear us uh, see, I will say. Uh, please tell me how to pronounce it if I'm doing it incorrectly.
we can see that you're here, but we can't see or hear you. Do you see anything related to microphones, uh, Sonia? Yes. Okay, I think you could. Can you hear us? We can hear and see you. Uh, okay. So thank you for waiting. We ran a little bit over. I appreciate your uh, taking the time to present and providing information and for waiting. Uh, we will not curtail your time period based on the delayed start. Uh, so please proceed as planned. Uh, uh, we're here to listen. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm here with my pastor, Aaron Song, and uh, Conan Riddle architect, Chris Foley, will be joining us. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the CPA committee for sending us 18 QA beforehand. So help us present our case, maximize, at the same time, minimize say any uh, misunderstanding or confusion. So, uh, well, Chris Foley will join us at his home and CPA could ask, uh, ask him relate to the our project with the roof repair and structural engineer analysis. So if I think he's joining us, I don't see him yet, but I see, I see him and the attendees. I did, oh, okay. I'm just getting, there he is. Okay. Uh, so maybe that committee would like to ask uh, Chris Foley related to our project first before we get to uh, rest of the question that we are giving. Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, you would want us to ask questions at this point in time, or do you wish for Chris to speak? Yes, Chris to present Chris to speak. on behalf okay. with the relate to the project. Wonderful. Uh, th thank you. Uh, and I hope I pronounced your, your name right. Uh, Chris, uh, please uh, go ahead. Well, uh, gr uh, greetings to, to the committee. Thank you very much for uh, giving us some time to uh, talk about the project. So um, we were retained by the Emmer Sion Church, um, gosh, six or eight weeks ago. Uh, to do an assessment, a structural and architectural assessment of um, uh, the existing roof structure uh, and the surrounding uh, roof trim, eaves, um, and drainage, uh, gutters and downspouts for the, for the building. Um, we worked with a structural engineer, uh, GNCB from uh, Connecticut. Uh, we did a site assessment uh, we did discover that the roof structure was really in, in, in uh, overall in, in quite good condition, except for a couple of specific areas where it appeared as though uh, there had been some water infiltration uh, into, the, into the, the attic space uh, and that there were uh, uh, two structural members, structural purlins that had been compromised uh, and then had, had caused the roof to sag a bit and had further exacerbated the, the, the infiltration of, of air and water into the building. I know that the Emmer Zion Church uh, had a, uh, uh, I guess I would call it a flood into the, into the basement portion of the building uh, that I think was uh, at least in, in part due to the fact that the, uh, the roof had sagged, the, the gutter had sagged, and therefore it wasn't working correctly. Um, so, so we did an assessment, uh, and as I said, discovered that a couple of purlins need to be replaced. Um, there are uh, 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 several sections of the, the eave trim, the, the, the crown moldings, the soffits, the fascias, the freeze boards that need to be replaced. Uh, they've also been compromised. And the gutter, the gutter and downspout system needs to be uh, repaired and in some places replaced. Um, and, and the assessment that we did for the church was really focused solely on, on those components. Um, uh, uh, those were the most pressing issues uh, that we saw in terms of water infiltration and, and, and damage and potential damage to the building. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we prepared some simple drawings uh, that I know the church used to get uh, some um, uh, 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 budget estimates for the work. 
Uh, we also had a, a, a report, a letter uh, prepared by our structural engineer. And then I know uh, Shi Kyung and the church um, approached numerous general contractors. Um, I believe that uh, at least in time for, 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 for this meeting, they were only able to get a response from, from one of the contractors. Um, but that's the, that's the, the, the primary scope uh, that, that we saw as being uh, imperative. Um, uh, the, the, the work really needs to be done or there's going to be uh, uh, a, a lot more damage to the building, not only the exterior, but also the interior as well, if that water and, and the elements are allowed to, uh, to continue to get into the building. Uh, so I think our, our drawings and our structural report uh, documented that. And I, I guess what I'd like to say is that, uh, Chi Kyung, I, I know that you had a number of other uh, um, pieces of potential improvements uh, that you had estimated. I'm not sure uh, if you're all, if you're including that with um, um, uh, uh, the, the features, uh, the, the repairs that need to be done, or if that's a separate uh, separate piece. So maybe I would ask you to speak to that. I will, after you finish, I will give a CPA explanation. Okay. Why was uh, giving CPA that large sums of money without specific details? So I so, will explain to them. Okay, so uh, that uh, in terms of an explanation of I think of the the immediate work that needs to be done. I I, I think I'm uh, my my part of the presentation is complete at this point. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, can I welcome. take uh, Robin? Go go ahead. Sorry, excuse, I just excuse me, to ask, Sorry, I apologize. I just wanted to catch Chris before uh, in case she was going to log off. Um, I just wanted uh, to clarify what if you could give a professional a, a sense of what. Um, uh, what timeline this work needs to be done on CPA usually operates on a fiscal uh, year basis where funds, where work can't start until July 1st and funds aren't available until July 1st. Obviously we have a lot of wet weather and snowy weather in between then and now we do have funds in reserve. So if you could um, weigh in on, if, if it's possible to weigh in on a uh, professional opinion on the timing of when the work should be completed by to prevent further damage, that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, so on, on the south side of the building, uh, uh, that that piece of structural work and and roof trim work that's really uh, the most imperative. Um, I, I, ideally, in my opinion, that work should be done immediately. Um, there is a, a, a similar scope of work on the north side, but the deterioration isn't quite as great, and I don't think the the danger is as immediate. Um, I, I do think that there are some uh, uh, steps that could be taken to uh, to stabilize um, the, uh, the the portion of the roof that's been damaged and the structure, um, perhaps over the winter until spring. But but in my opinion, it should be done as soon as as practical. Uh, the work should be done. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, si Kyung, uh, you were going to be uh, speaking. Okay, when our church submitted the CPA application by September 30th, we didn't have all the specific details as far as how much project total cost. So in the meantime, that Peter Ham was from a Historical Preservation Association. He came out to our church, he looked at it. And so he gave us rough estimate of $659,000 with the staging, repair, roofing, and painting. Reason that he put a painting is, I thought a sense that they are gonna set up the staging uh, to the repair roof. I thought I'd kill one, uh, you know, uh, two birds in a one stone that need a paint when, if we do the painting, uh, we have to do the staging at the same time. So. That's, that's why I asked them uh, to give us a painting estimate too. It's not his fault that he put that on. I asked them because that when we were preparing CPA application, 
And one of the questions says, list the, all the exterior work that we like to have done. So that's why we put it there. But now that uh, Chris just mentioned, they're focused on roof repair and structural engineer aspect. So costs will be uh, reduced from what we were asking. That was just estimate what we had. That's the only thing we had. And the director of a CPA sent me the email uh, as to how much that we are seeking CPA. So we told them that it's uh, have to be to be announced because we don't have all the necessary material to send it out to general contractors. So in the meantime, that they give us an estimate and uh, director asked me send that rough estimate. So put a figure down. That's what happened. And now that we know what's what, and historical commission asked us to prioritize what is needed. And Chris just mentioned the south side of the art building is a needed uh, work has to be done uh, before winter. So that have to be prioritized. But at this year, we are seeking only to base on the work uh, rough draft from Chris Foley. Uh, roof repair and structural uh, replace, repair, replace. And that's so amount will be reduced quite a bit. And uh, like I mentioned when we started that we got to this 18 question QA and we wrote down most of the question is uh, our private funding. How are we going to come up with the private funding? I listed on a number seven that we have a 25 to 30 congregation weekly attending. But uh, in the meantime, we are started as a $50 committed uh, construction fund. Uh, we started already. I know that's merely dropping a bucket where we are seeking to GPA, but then I have a list of five different things. We're gonna do plan on next spring, uh, Western Mass Korean Community Golf Tournament event. Well, our Korean community uh, from different church, we help each other if something happened. So we are planning on next spring, 2023. Then North Amherst community event like a bake sale, tech sale and concert, uh, things like that. Then, we're gonna ask our Church of Nazarene in New England district. We are, denomination is Church of Nazarene. Then also seeking Central Church of Nazarene in Kansas. And we ask you CPA support too. So that's where the private funding will be coming. So Chris Foley uh, give you his professional aspect what has been done and our church, what well, we're gonna come up with the, our own private fund and that's yeah. But th thank you, Sikyung, for uh, talking about the project and alluding to some of the things that you are uh, looking to do. Um, we are slightly tight on time, but that's not gonna prevent us from proceeding with some questions. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to remind committee members and uh, also uh, applicants just Try to try to answer as quickly as possible and thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I see your hand uh, up. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thank you, CQN, for all your work in trying to nail this down over the past month. So today we received a letter from um, the Historical Preservation Associates dated November 16th with mm -hmm. a revised estimate of 158,700. Is that your revised request? Well, that have to be, I don't know exactly. We only have a one estimate from general contractor. But I mean, is that the, yeah. is that kind of the scope of the request now? So it's gone from 600 and um, 89,000, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. down to, to down to, so now now the request is more like around 160,000. Well, I would say about 200,000. Okay. Uh, Robin, your hand is up. Uh, yep. Um, uh, I was curious if there are 
other estimates coming in, and I also had another question for Chris, if he can just clarify, uh, is it necessary in order to stabilize the roof and keep it from leaking to proceed with the slate roof at this point, or would it be possible just to tighten up the existing roof uh, if, uh, if we needed more time to get more funding. So two questions. I guess the first one is for you, Sikyung, meaning are there more estimates coming? Yes. And okay. we had a two general contractor. One just sent me email. He withdraw because he doesn't have a, enough manpower. So I call somebody else, general contractor, and we are planning on meeting after the Thanksgiving. I know his timing is not on our side, but we are trying best we can with the permitted situation. Um, Chris, uh, the second half of the question was related to uh, the need to do the slate uh, at this time or not. Did that essentially correct, Robin? Okay. So um, I, I uh, just based on my visual inspection of the roof, I think the 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 vast majority of the roof is actually appears to be in good condition. And I think there could be some temporary temporary measures taken to button up the the the, the breaches uh, in the envelope, uh, perhaps for the winter, and then the work could 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 be done in 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 the spring and summer of next year. Um, but but some amount of of, of uh, temporary um, temporary work needs to happen to protect because there's there are open. Uh, uh, open holes into the building. We saw a uh, proposal that came to us today, uh, Sikyong, regarding a, a, not the full roof, but a portion. I think Matt alluded to it, somewhere around 160,000 or so that was for okay. portions. Is that, I don't know if you saw that, Chris, or not, but is that what you're referring to, Chris? Or are you referring to a smaller scale emergency fixing, for lack of a better term, uh, a triage prior to the 160? So, so my understanding, I, I did see a copy of that uh, proposal from Historic Preservation Associates, and my understanding is, is that that's for the, the the full scope of the re-roofing that's required, the the yeah. woodwork that's required, the painting, the and the structural work, and all the associated scaffolding. So, what I'm talking about for, uh, you know, kind of emergency stabilization would be some, some, some I think, quite a bit of a smaller portion okay. uh, to just protect. The interior of the building, the structure, until the the uh, the full scope of the repairs could be done, uh, probably. It certainly term. would be helpful to get information related to that if it's an option on the table, given our budgeting situation and what the estimates for that might be as well. Uh, Andy, thank you for waiting. Thanks, Sam, um, and thanks for the presentation. I think my question is for Chris. I just want to make sure I understand the scope. In in your letter from the twenty second, you mentioned. Architectural survey, the structural engineering survey. Um, but I guess has any of that been done? Like you, has your survey been completed? Is that something that's still being requested? I, I, I so uh, my understanding, uh, if I understand your question, so we uh, Kuhn Riddle has done uh, an architectural assessment, uh, a focused asses assessment of uh, of the existing breaches in the envelope. Uh, we hired a consultant, a structural consultant, uh, GNCB uh, engineers, to do a, specifically a structural assessment, and and so both of those have been completed at this time. Those are all right. Okay, um, very good. That was just my question relative to scope. Thank well, you. Matt. Yeah. So I this is for C Kyung. Um, so obviously this is a historic building um, that is important in the town and. We don't want it to, um, we want it to be maintained. I just have a general concern, you know, in comparison to the South Church, um, uh, which uh, in their proposal, they said that they have a, an annual maintenance budget of 35 to 50,000, which is their annual budget for maintaining that they've, you know, been doing constantly, consistently, and they're not like a decade behind. So this, their, their building is in pretty good shape. and just the size and the scope of a historic building is going to require, um, you know, that kind of a range each year. So I just sort of going forward beyond this immediate fix, have a concern as to how, how, how are you going to get there? Well, compare apple to apple, we are nowhere near the South 
uh, Congregational Amherst uh, Congregational Church. Uh, they're compared to us, they're mega church. They have a more congregation. Uh, therefore, they have a more budget to maintain the building. Like I mentioned a little while ago, our church is only 25 to 30 people and small congregation. We've been stewardship this church only 10 years and we try our best to custodian role and with the, we, we had a $16,000 budget yearly. And with that, uh, 9,500 goes to liability insurance. So we made about five, six thousand, fifty five hundred dollars $5,500 yearly. So we take care of the here and there, small job, whatever that is visible that we've been fixing and maintain it. Uh, I know it's concern for CPA give us this uh, uh, grant and how we're gonna maintain. We are going to do our best just like we have been. And now that we are aware of this uh, visible uh, repair needed with the deteriorating in aspect. So we're trying to set the budget a little more higher to so maintain it as possible. So maybe that we don't have to come sick CPA, not that soon. Maybe next year we have to come, but uh, after that, uh, we are trying to do our best with the giving our situation, giving our budget. So we're trying to stretch a little more, uh, set the budget higher than $15,000 yearly. Uh, thank you, Sikyong. Uh, I just have a quick comment. We're gonna only have a couple minutes here left. Uh, okay. I just, aside from your project, just FYI, I, I was a contractor for 10 years doing different mm -hmm. types of work. Okay. And I saw the staging being referenced with an expense and a rental and the painting mm -hmm. essence. I was a painting yeah. contractor for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, one comment, two comments that I have for anyone who's okay. seeking large projects. Mm -hmm. It is very much in the uh, organization that's paying to get the work done or the, or the owners of the building. You get multiple estimates. Uh, yeah. And secondly, You'd be amazed at how efficient a bucket truck is in related, oh, okay. certainly for painting. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe I ever used staging in 10 years. That's me. Other contractors might use it depending on the nature of the restoration work. But I'm just indicating it's worth pursuing all the different variables okay. in your interest, particularly when finance is tight. I can't say what's best, mm -hmm. but I do know that. Uh, Bucket trucks are phenomenal in terms of speed and efficiency. And I don't know if they're appropriate. I, I'm sure you have a lot more information on that, Chris. I just wanted to raise this as an aside. If it was my mom who's no longer with us, or my grandmother, if it was my friend, anyone, I would make that recommendation to anyone. Check around and, and see what's out there. Sean, uh, we're running real tight, but I see your hand is up. I'd like to ask, invite you into for a quick comment if you're able, and then we're gonna have to end here. Thank you, Sam. I just wanted to confirm, Sikyung, um, what is the amount of your request? I wanna make sure that Sonia and I have it in the spreadsheet properly. I heard Matt say one number, but I see the quote, the total on the quote is for 561,804. So I just wanna make sure we get the right amount uh, of the request down. Forget the 561,000 uh, because that's not it. And we like to seek whatever needs to be done to repair and replace roof and structural. Uh, that's, where we're, that's what we are seeking with the, based on what Chris Foley have done, uh, his work and the structural engineer assessment. We submitted to a CPA so maybe based on, you know, uh, give us whatever is support us, then we'll be great. A recommendation is that you might uh, just have a short note that would clarify what you just said to reference uh, what you believe is an appropriate amount given the changes and perhaps mm -hmm. even something that might take into account what Chris had alluded as another option. So yes. Um, yes. Um, uh, Robin, do you have something very quick? We can't hear you. You're on mute, Robin. There we go. Yeah, I'm just looking at the. Um, I'm looking at the letter that we received. Uh, let's see. This is from October 9th. 
revised November 16th, there's a bolded line item that says project project total for roof repairs at eaves only for plan and specifications, 158,700, which includes a 15% contracting fee. That seems to be the roofing re repair subtotal. Uh, Maybe that's helpful. Uh, it, it is helpful. And if there's any updates to that C. Young uh, okay. and or Chris via C. Young, uh, please inform us in a timely manner. We will. Uh, I'd like to thank you. I'm sorry that uh, we're uh, busy here, but it's certainly a complicated project. We understand that uh, you've tried to put this together quickly. Uh, it's a, a difficult task, and there's certainly a lot that needs to get done on the building, and some of it being pressing. It's certainly a historic uh, building. Uh, having said that, uh, there's lots of questions to be managed. One would be, uh, what needs to get done immediately and what can get done for less. And the other question that seems to have come up with a few folks is, uh, have you pursued as many avenues as you might to get really thorough cost estimates and alternatives of how to approach it? I, I think that's in uh, everyone's interest, so certainly in the uh, owners of the building interest. We may communicate with you further at a later okay, point in good. time, uh, okay. but thank you so much for your thorough uh, amount of work that you've done to try to present the description to us. Uh, and uh, even though it's ongoing, uh, in the description process, because it's complicated. And thank you for taking the time to present. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for your clarity and for your communication. We may have further questions. Before you go, just two things. Thank you for the tips. And another one, we will do better next time. And thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very much to the thank committee. Thank you. Bye-bye. Appreciate so the time. Okay. So um, our next presenter who has been waiting patiently uh, is the South Church. If we're able to bring in, uh, excuse me, uh, if we're able to bring in uh, Stephen maybe, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, and if there's anyone else uh, that uh, you want, Stephen, let us know, please. Uh, and thank you again for uh, waiting here. So um, we'll see who comes in. Are you here, Sa Sha uh, Sonia? Are you able to uh, get, I see Stephen is in now. So can you um, please bring in Mike Schaefer and Mark Marasco? We're waiting for that. And by the way, Stephen, we will not uh, make a penalize you for the time that That's you've all right. start in your uh, you're the last non non town proposal so we'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, discuss thoroughly uh, your uh, well, well I've topic. timed it I've timed it and it's four minutes and 48 seconds well yeah you, you're welcome to use the time as you would <laughs> <laughs> so um thanks for the opportunity to speak to uh, with the committee today so my name is Steve maybe and I'm a cur the current chair of the South Church Board of Trustees, and Mark Marasco, who's on the call, is another member of the board, and Mike Schaefer, who's the structural engineer with Huntley Associates, he's on the call as well. And rounding out our team is Matt Wilcox of Wilcox Builders, who's been helping us with uh, developing cost estimates. So the South Church steeple, as shown on the left, has four sections, the barrel at the top, the belfry, the tower and the tower base. The bottom two sections have a wooden support structure for the tower walls and the roof upon which the bell sits. The top two sections have a separate wooden support structure inside the tower and the tower base, which is the primary area where we're having problems. The pictures that show on the right are just a few examples of the issues that we are having in each of the four sections of the steeple from top to bottom. These are just examples. Um, number one is the barrel. There's significant water penetration and subsequent rot going on in the barrel. Number two is uh, we have rotting bell supports and deterioration of uh, in the roof structure that supports the bell. Number three is uh, deteriorated columns in the tower, which is part of the interior support system for the belfry and the barrel. 
And then uh, number uh, four is the crack beam that's in the tower base, which again is part of the support system for the belfry and the barrel. In addition, we're having a lot of issues with water penetration within the tower roof, the walls, and at the gable roof connections. We've done a lot of uh, attempts at patching over time, and they haven't worked well for us. Um, and I think the main point that where we're at now is that to, to keep using that kind of a Band-Aid approach is, is counterproductive, and, and we're just ending up spending dollars without really fixing the problem once and for all. So our goal right now is to remove and replace the barrel and belfry using a crane and, and, and rebuild them, remove the internal structural system that's supporting them and the walls of the tower and tower base, then rebuild the tower and tower base walls with shear walls and roof framing capable of supporting the new uh, barrel and belfry when they're replaced and then address water penetration issues, especially where the roof line meets the tower and, and tower base. And I don't think I need to go through all this list in detail. Most of this was in our application, but our building remains a resource for the community today, just as it has been from the beginning. And we will continue to seek opportunities to make our building available to the community as a civic space. So to sum up and to update you on some of the uh, answers to the questions that we submitted back in November 4th, we consider the project to be somewhat urgent um, and we're ready to go. Uh, we have initial plans. We have a contractor who's interested in doing the work. The timing works well for July 1 because this is definitely a summer project, not something that we really want to do in the winter. Um, the funding that we're requesting will be used for complete restoration of the four sections, as I described previously. We've made, or we can and will make every effort to limit uh, the amount of money that we requested. I th we think we have a good budget. We did contact the Amherst Science Church of the Nazarene as requested and offered to share our expertise and resources However, we haven't yet really found any economies of scale or other sources of savings there. We have examined other sources of funding, but the timing is, is something that we're not sure fits our needs. The Mass Historical Commission Preservation Project funds, the new round 29 is not up yet. It'll be up in December. But when you look at their detailed timeline, the typical start date for those is, is November, which is a bit late uh, for a, a project that should be done in the summer. We also looked at the National Fund for Sacred Places. Again, their awards are not made until October. And then there's a period of consultation and technical assistance that actually can extend quite a few months beyond October. And I looked at their recent, their, last year they had 305 letters of intent. They invited 30 congregations to file full applications. They, award, they awarded between 12 and 15. So it's 5% or less success rate. So it's, it's a very, very competitive process. But the additional limitation to that particular funding source for us is that only after you've been accepted into the program can you then raise funds, either through private donations or through other grants. Only then can you raise those funds. So the CPA funding, if we were granted some funds, wouldn't necessarily qualify because it's before you would be accepted into the application, which into the program, which doesn't happen until October. So there's some issues there. But we do anticipate to provide at least 10% of the total construction costs. And we've already invested 15,000 in the project and have committed another 18,000 for design work. And you asked the question about funding this through our operating budget. Um, it's really not possible. Uh, pledging units are, are down and we're still recovering from the fallout of, of, of COVID. But that's our that's our presentation, and we're certainly happy to entertain any questions uh, and provide any more information. 
uh, that you need to make this work. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. And I have to say, I, I'm quite familiar with the church. Uh, I've been to many weddings there. Uh, as you well know, my uh, grandparents were very active in the church and my aunt and uh, cousins were married there. It was, uh, it's always nice to uh, see what the, the church is doing. And I, I certainly can attest to the volume of community uh, involvement in civic outreach from this uh, church. Uh, I also wanted to comment that uh, I love the photo that you put up because I drive by and see that photo, uh, the image of the church and the steeple. And I've commented over the last three years to my daughter every morning when I drive her to school, I'm like, Elizabeth, take a look at that steeple. <laughs> and you can see the pitch. I don't know if it's been accelerating or not. And I, I know there's been a lot of work done there. But it's really noticeable. And when I read the proposal and saw the references to being able to support the bell tower, supported or rather not supported, pun intended, uh, by the cracks on the on the dome, it uh, resonated with me. Dare I say? Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. That was my comment about the extent of the pitch that I can see when I drive by it every day. Uh, I'd like to open up the. Uh, floor to questions from the committee. Uh, I saw Robin, your hand up first. So thank Robin. Um, thank you for that presentation and particularly the feedback on other sources of funding. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, I don't have personal experience with this, but I know that when I was digging around, I was trying to develop a, um, a, a data sheet of uh, preservation funds um, that varied in the language on the not very easy to read um, mass preservation projects fund page. There's a statement that um, emergency stabilization funds are available um, off uh, grant cycle. Um, I know that they're challenging to get in touch with, and I don't know that your project would qualify for emergency stabilization funds, but it certainly looks like something that might, um, if you'll pardon the pun, lean in that direction. <laughs> um, so that might be just because we are so stretched um, in our CPA asks uh, this year and in, and it seems like in a couple of years prior to, um, it would be worth an inquiry there to see if um, um, the Mass Historic Commission um, could at least get back to you on that um, uh, because it, that does seem to be something that they offer. And it would be helpful for the Historical Commission to know if that's a helpful avenue as well. We'll look into it. Uh, Tim, I believe your hand was up next. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm just looking at the proposal and the project cost estimate that I saw was the 259, 210, which is equal to the request of the CPA committee. You said that you would cover 10% of the cost. So is the actual request 10% less of 259, 210? That, that would be correct. <laughs> so we need to revise our figure, correct? Yes. Okay. I didn't do the math. Sonia, you're the accountant. You can. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Katie. Thanks, Sam, and thanks, Stephen, for your presentation and the proposal. I had a follow-up question to Tim's, which was, I thought there were two estimates. One was 196, and I didn't know what the difference was between the two, and if um, I had the same question as Tim, is like, what was the actual amount that you were requesting? Um, yeah. Um, then I had one other small clarification, but if you want to answer that. Yeah. Uh, maybe Mike Schaefer can answer that. 196 is the contractor's cost estimate, and the others are a contingency and soft costs for engineering. Okay. So the 60,000 are those two pieces. Correct. Got it. Okay. Um, so the other question, just to, for clarification, you had in your proposal mentioned the 10%. Um, you know, covering that portion. And there was a reference to having already covered some costs and that there would be additional costs, you know, having to um, take on before July 1st. 
And so I wasn't sure. And also you mentioned that a portion of the 200th anniversary fundraising campaign would go to this. So I wasn't clear if what portion was which and if it was going to end up being more than the 25,000, you had already spent some, some money already. Right. Um, so I wasn't sure. The uh, the ten percent is we're anticipating would come from the two hundredth birthday campaign. The additional money, the fifteen thousand and the eighteen thousand, is not included. That's extra over and above the twenty five. That's the ten percent. Thank you. And soft costs may be defined as soft, although they get paid with the same dollars. <laughs> Uh, Although we, I'm sorry. yes, uh, I don't oh, we, see we did have a mark. Yes, we, we did have a question. Um, I know you said in a prior presentation and in your literature that um, you know any costs from the CPA funding would have to be done after July first. However, because we're so eager to get going, we'd like to start the engineering work prior to that. If we were to spend money prior to that, could that be considered part of our match? I don't believe we're allowed to uh, reimburse for funds already expended. Uh, whether but that... if it was our match, it wouldn't be the CPA funds. Oh, it would be our match right, portion of, of the right. total project. Well, yes, because then you could tell us verbally at this point in time before we deliberate that the amount of the match is actually less than you. You could retract that matching amount. <laughs> That, but we'd really love it to be more <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure possible um, but if i understand correctly uh, the essence of your question is that uh, you're hoping to be able to uh, all things being you know lining up properly you'd like to start as soon as you could if i understand it correctly yeah our, our goal would be to do some of the engineering and, and drawings the soft costs ahead of time so that when july first hits you know, if that portion is our, you know, mm -hmm. part of our twenty-five thousand dollars that we're saying we will match, could we get that done ahead of July first, and then, you know, start construction that, actually in the summertime? Yeah. Is I correct uh, in I, my I, response, uh, Sonia? Um, if it's private money, it's not under our purview. Yeah. So okay. as long as he's yeah. not spending CPA money or incurring costs yeah. for CPA money to be reimbursed, we're fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, additional questions or comments uh, from committee members on the project? When will you uh, make your decisions or recommendations? So in case we wanna come back to you with more information before you sure. make your decisions. Our, every, well, a couple of things in context. Uh, we meet every year. Every year there are funds taken out of the town that are part of the tax dollars that are contributed to CPA and typically matched by a state amount uh, that were available for spending through all our different projects. We never know exactly what that's going to be, uh, but it's average, I don't know, million point two. I'm, I'm just guessing. Uh, so every year we come, but we don't know what projects will be in front of us. For example, this year there's a ton, and that may be something that continues. We don't know. Uh, but in terms of this cycle, we have a number of other presentations yet to hear, uh, and we currently have presentations scheduled for December 1st. Thereafter, we begin our process of discussions. Uh, we typically have been able to come to determinations over the course of a couple of weeks, that is to say a couple of meetings. This year might be more difficult. We don't, I, I, I'm not gonna commit to that because we wanna be thorough in our process. There's a lot for us to consider, uh, but that during my last three years has been the case that we've been able to uh, come to resolution in that time frame. but it could be a bit longer. Uh, we may have some additional questions for uh, any of the uh, <clears throat> applicants, in which case we would email them. Um, the process, once we as a committee generate our recommendations for funding of various projects and vote on it and approve it, is we then present it to the town council. The town council 
is the ultimate decision maker on whether or not to allocate the funds. They can't allocate funds to things we have not as a committee recommended. So they can't exceed our recommendations, nor can they alter our recommendations in terms of switching which project it might go to. But nothing gets funded without the town council's final authorization. Uh, once that occurs, then it goes to the town, uh, I guess I would say procurement office, contracting group, for lack of a better term, uh, who then uh, generate the grants and the specific details uh, for historic preservation. Uh, there's apt to be some caveats or, or uh, some items uh, tied to the uh, maintenance and or uh, you know, historic preservation restrictions potentially, uh, which is one of the questions, but that's the general process. One more, uh, after Thanksgiving, we'll have one more presentation meeting. Then we'll start to literally deliberate for the next two Thursdays, maybe three, come to a resolution, then uh, go to the town council typically in January. But once we've made the recommendation, that's a good indicator uh, that it's apt to proceed, but it really depends on the council's final authorization. So I just want to chime in and say there's an annual public hearing that we have every year, and uh, it's going to be December 8th. So uh, if you have supporters or something that want to come to the public hearing and voice their support or be there to answer any more questions, that's a good time to come in and advocate for your. Should we resubmit our request and subtract off the 10% from that number? <laughs> Uh, you can, or I can. Okay. Just All right. There, do won't be a, there would not be any negative, or at least I don't believe the committee would have any uh, negative uh, mindset towards a more precise application. Okay. Thank you. Uh, other members' comments? Well, apparently the proposal was very thorough and informative. Uh, it's, uh, I, I particularly like the photos of the, the clarity of the photos inside showing the damages to the beams uh, is you can see exactly what's there. Uh, so we may or may not have further questions for you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for coming to us uh, and for such a very thorough uh, and well, in my opinion, well-researched uh, proposal. Uh, Certainly, uh, as many of the projects, a very important building, um, and we will go through our processes, and we may or may not reach out with additional questions in the meantime. Uh, and thank you, all three of you, for taking the time to be here and to answer our questions. Thank you for the work you do. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. So uh, this is a longer meeting than uh, we anticipated. I've let a couple of the presentations go on longer for the non-town ones, uh, just because I felt it was uh, the most efficient use of our time to, to let them clarify what they were asking. We have not as of yet uh, dealt with the very first presentation, which I assumed was Bob Berger, who's no uh, Ben Berger, who's no longer here, but I do see Dave, Dave in the audience. Here. Yeah. Um, and if Dave is uh, able to present <laughs> on that project, that would be great. I see sure. you, Dave. Sure, nice to see you all. Good evening. I know your meeting's running late, so I'm gonna be very, very brief here. Um, and I apologize, I was coming from another meeting tonight. Um, normally this would be one of my staff presenting, uh, Ben Brager, who uh, has worked for a couple of years with the Historical Commission and done a wonderful job. I recently got a new job, so Ben has moved on. So I am uh, uh, pinch hitting here tonight. I um, I may not have all the answers for you, but um, I know you have a number of meetings coming up. So if we don't have all the answers, uh, we will get them for you. But essentially, I think the, the proposal that uh, was put forth uh, by staff, Ben in particular, um, with the support of the Historical Commission and certainly with my support, was for $20,000 for uh, legal legal funds to help with the preparation uh, and the writing and the coordination of historic preservation restrictions. These are the restrictions that are required. And, and I know you're talking about 
you've just, um, you know, I've listened to a number of presentations tonight on, on his potential historic preservation projects. Um, I actually didn't hear HPRs come up, but I believe all of those application applicants who have asked for funding for the two churches and the, the building in the uh, Wildwood Cemetery have been asked if they would accept historic preservation restrictions on their buildings. It is a requirement of the CPA, uh, and this is something that typically falls to staff to do. And we have historically, historically, we it has been our practice to work with town council, uh, town attorney, I'm sorry, to, um, to do these restrictions. It is very time consuming. Each one is unique. There's a lot of research that goes into them. My staff can do some of that research, but ultimately it comes down to often lawyers talking and writing with other lawyers from the applicant, be it a church, be it a, a, a building on Main Street, be it the Women's Club, the UU, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these often get bogged down because we just don't have the, the time to work on them. And that can create challenges because once the town has um, given money to a project, we want to get that historic preservation restriction on the building as soon as possible. So it's a fairly straightforward uh, proposal, $20,000. Um, um, ben Brager and Nate Malloy from my staff estimated that's probably would get us, you know, two to four um, uh, HPRs on those properties. Robin may be able to speak more to this um, because uh, I know um, Ben and Nate spoke with the Historical Commission about it. But the bottom line is we need to kind of break the log jam here and get some of these done. I will say, and Sonia or Sean may be able to speak to this, but um, his, uh, in the past, these funds have simply come from the town. So we're engaging town attorney and these projects uh, are essentially being picked up. The cost of the legal time is being picked up by the town. It makes sense to a lot of us that because these are associated with historic preservation projects, there really should be some funds coming from CPAC to do this. I don't know whether it would be uh, in particular through through the historical line or through the administrative line, uh, Sonia or Sean could speak to that more specifically. I think Ben uh, Ben answered uh, all of your questions. Um, I'm happy to to take any more of your questions if I can answer them. I will. I work with I have worked with Ben and with Nate on these through the years, and as I said, uh, they are very time consuming, and um, with any legal document, the devil is really in the details. And there's a lot of back and forth between the entities, between the town, and also between um, ultimately Mass Historic has to review these, and that takes a tremendous amount of time and back and forth as well. So I'll stop there and take any of your questions, and I'll do the best I can if, uh, um, if you have them. Uh, thank you, Dave. Just another busy, uh, busy day for you, right? <laughs> yeah, for all of us, sure. <laughs> standard, standard, uh, sixteen-hour day. Uh, Tim, uh, quick question, Dave. Give me an example of what an HPR is uh, for a project. <laughs> so, uh, a historic preservation restriction um, typically focuses on the outside of a building. It does not, by and large, address what happens inside a building. It's typically about the facade. It can be about the grounds. Um, it can be about, you know, the roof, the windows. It's really protecting those features that uh, the external features of the building. Um, we have done historic preservation restrictions on parts of the Jones Library, the um, historic Kimball House over on Northeast Street, the brick federal house on Northeast Street that is so prominent to the to the east of Northeast Street. Um, the, the UU building and, and the um, parts of the UU building and the, the, uh, the stained glass window in the UU and, and you know, other structures like that. Um, so every time, you know, and again, you have a couple of proposals before you, if, if a church or a house or a barn is um, preserved in some way with, um, CPA funds, it requires a, at this point, a permanent restriction be placed on that part of the structure. So that 
no one else in the future can change it. Basically, that's what that is. Change the or um, there within reason things can be changed. But in other words, if there, you know, okay. if there is a historic feature of the exterior of the house or the barn or the church, um, that those features should remain relatively the same. Thank you. But it does not get into, for the most part, the internal uh, layout of the building. Is that Matt? Uh, yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, uh, you actually answered some of my questions just now in your presentation. So um, one question I still do have, do you have a sense as how other towns do this? Uh, that's a really good question, and I don't have the answer to that. I, I can certainly get it for you, Matt, and for the committee. Um, I think, well, as with anything in CPA, I think all towns are different depend on their, depending on their size and complexity. Um, I was going to say that one of the comparisons I didn't make is that in a similar way, uh, think of historic preservation restrictions like a conservation restriction or an agricultural preservation restriction so that when a town or city puts in public money, there needs to be a public benefit and by and large, um, Amherst has gone for permanent historic preservation restrictions. Some communities actually do lim time limited restrictions, 30 years, 40 years. We haven't really gotten into that yet, although it's something we're looking at. So Maybe the historical commission could come up with some standards around that. But sort of a separate question is, like I, I looked through the sample and I did some research on the state uh, website about this. It seems like basically it's it's a legal document that goes into the registry of deeds that has a certain amount of boilerplate and then a certain amount that's specific to the, the specific site that you're talking about, the specific quality that you want to preserve. Um, I'm just wondering, are we, are we, are we, is, are we sort of, um, over-engineering them? Could we just do them in a simpler way? Um, well, my understanding is if they are permanent, then they need to go through Mass Historic, and Mass Historic has the final say in reviewing those. So, And they're really persnickety? And they're really um, specific, yes, about what they oh. require in those documents. Um, so... In a similar way, as I mentioned, an APR, an agricultural preservation restriction or a conservation restriction, um, there are state standards, there are state boilerplate um, pieces of those that must be in the document or the state won't approve them. So that's what gives it the permanence that, as you said, it, it runs with the deed of the property. So the next owner and the next owner and the next owner when they purchase those those properties and it changes hands even within the family it runs with the deed so the, the goal is to try to protect that historic research uh, resource at least the external features of it as long as possible michelle i think i think robin was first robin you want to go oh i'm sorry i got it backwards uh robin that's fine. Oh, I just uh, was just going to give an example of uh, um, maybe an easy to understand example would be um, the replacement of um, historic windows with vinyl replacement windows. Those those original windows would be considered what we call character defining features, and that is the purpose of the preservation restriction to protect the historic character of the significant resource. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Um, yeah, so Dave, I, I see that the 20K will cover about four based on the answers to your question, and there's two in the backlog and two of progress, so that's four. Based on the um, proposals that we have before us, are we looking at sort of accumulating a new backlog? Because as you said, I, don't, I didn't hear anybody mention any kind of historical restrictions tonight or Mostly. So I'm, I guess I, I think this is very important and I'm just wondering if it should be sort of more um, ingrained with the approach. No, really good questions, Michelle. Um, I didn't prepare this, this proposal, so I'm, uh, I'm going a little bit on kind of 
my own history with HBRs and CRs and APRs, but I think we we could certainly, I, I think I, I understand the gist of your question. I think we, I think Ben put it together based on what is in the queue and not as not necessarily on what you might approve this round of funding and the town or recommend to the town council this round of funding. But there's no question in my mind, there's at least three proposals that if you fund all or part of them, they would require HBRs. So you're right. If if the, if you recommend those three to the council and they are approved, um, that would create more of a backlog, if you will. So that number of 20,000 might not go as far. We also have never done this before. And, and frankly, we did not look back. It's kind of cumbersome to look back in the years of legal billing, essentially, and say, well, how much have we spent on this over the course of three years or five years? I can tell you it's a very significant amount of money because I've been involved in many of the conversations about the Kimball House and the Jones Library and some of the other buildings. Um, so I think you're right, Michelle. Uh, you know, that's a good point that if 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 two or three of those are approved and rec or recommended and approved by the council, there will be more work to be done. We're, we're looking at this as kind of a pilot to see how it works, but we do need to bake it into the cost. This is a real cost and it's not been accounted for up until now. Robin? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, your hand's still up. Uh, Katie? Yeah, I, Dave, I'm just for clarification, um, and thanks for pinch hitting. Um, I, in the questions and answers and in the proposal, I got the sense, and I, I'm getting a different sense from you tonight, that there isn't a, um, a requirement um, that, that there isn't um, a policy that says every single um, project has to have a historic preservation um, restriction. It sounds like you're saying it does if it's funded with CPA. I, I got the understanding, like if we owned the, you know, if the if the town owned the property, it had to. Or if, but if the, if it wasn't an ownership piece of it, so I just I'm just not sure I understand. Maybe everyone else does, and I apologize. No, it's it's a good question, and I may not be be able to answer it fully. But it is what I can tell you is it has been our practice that that at least with all structures, that if we fund structural improvements to a building to preserve that building, that we require a permanent restriction. Something like, you know, something like a painting or a dress, Emily Dickinson's dress, we, my understanding is we have not. I think there is some flexibility. There must be a restriction. The length of the restriction is, um, I think there is some discretion town by town, city by city in the length of the of the uh, restriction. And I, I have been involved in, in discussions, um, you know, preliminary discussions with our town attorney, Sharin Everett, on whether the town working with the Historical Commission might bring some sort of a policy recommendation. In other words, maybe there's a, a, a gradated, you know, if it's $50,000, that might be 10 years. If it's $100,000, that might be 30 years, something like that. But our practice has been that, um, that we, we do require a permanent restriction. Um, and again, I will say, I think all three, the two churches and then the Dickinson home in, in Wildwood Cemetery, I think those are significant asks. I would call them significant asks. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think everyone is over 200,000, if I'm not mistaken. But it, that certainly would be our practice to ask for a permanent, to require a permanent restriction. Now, as Sonia knows, and, and Sonia works very closely with us, the challenge here is that we have to go into the, uh, we have to go into the discussion with these entities, these private entities, um, with them knowing full well that they must do this. And so, the challenge is when when they get into the details, some and they have a lawyer representing them. Sometimes um, uh, they they back out; they're not okay. willing to do it. So um, and 
we're we're in negotiations right now with some of the uh, private entities that uh, the, the CPAC re recommended um, last round, talking with them to see if they will go forward. If they don't go forward, then they won't be funded. Okay, that that was my that was that was th thank you for answering that question because I didn't know if it was in our application that said it would be required so that people would know it up front versus at the end. Every one of the applicants should know um, because my staff has talked to them already that there is a requirement okay. of a restriction. And it was interesting, we were talking earlier, you were talking um, about the barn, the inventory of barns, historic outbuildings, et cetera. And we actually, I believe the CPAC, and Sonia may recall this more closely than I did, but I believe CPAC recommended fifty to $80,000 for um, uh, the preservation of a historic barn. It happens to be very close to me here in South Amherst on West Street before you get down near Mission Cantina on the left. And um, we thought it was a great project. The, the owner thought it was a great project. In the meantime, they sold the property and the next owner did not think it was a great a private project because of the historic preservation restriction and they backed out. So that 50,000 or maybe it was $80,000, I can't remember, was never spent. Um, and unfortunately that barn is is um, vulnerable to demolition or just, uh, you know, uh, falling down eventually. Yeah, thank you. So it's, a, it's, it's definitely a dance. It's a complex, you know, process and dance and it comes with, you know, there is the carrot and there's the stick, which is you need the, the public needs to get something out of this, and that is the restriction, as well as you know driving by, walking by, biking by a historic structure in perpetuity. Hopefully, there, there certainly is some resources from the uh, the, the uh, state uh, Stuart senator and others. I sent some links to everyone. Uh, I did read also, Katie, that, that you know it's certainly mandated when the town purchases and owns a building, but there's flexibility depending on the communities, uh, although Dave's provided us what the current standard tends to be for Amherst. Um, in reading the proposal, Dave, uh, although it came from um, uh, Ben, um, I saw two things in the proposal. One uh, primary was for funding for legal work related. Uh, and looking at some of the uh, proposals, I saw there are some covenants that are less, you know, some may, so, some covenants exist that are not as restrictive as some of the other uh, preservation restrictions. There's differing legal language in there, but I see how each one might be distinct. There are some templates that exist. I'm sure the town has them. Uh, that they take and then adapt. And there are some from the from the uh, coalition that were recommended. My guess is they're all similar. Uh, but I see two different aspects to the request, one being funding to accomplish the legal requirements to affect the uh, differing types of agreements. Uh, and secondly, I see a request for policy, setting policy. My thoughts are that it may well be that uh, the policy wouldn't be ideal to be uh, generated by somebody who's a consultant as somebody who's vested to the same degree in the town, such as the historical commission and or other committees that are involved. That would be my recommendation that there might be some committees uh, and or town staff who are vested locally as opposed to an external factor uh, to come up with whatever those policies might be. I distinguish that from the um, uh, blocking and tackling, for lack of a better word, affiliated with the uh, legal fees. That's that's how I read the proposal. It seems to me uh, that the committee here, the CPA committee may, may have some thoughts on what makes sense, uh, but the uh, historical commission likely uh, is a good place to start with their recommendations. I'd have greater faith with the uh, local committee uh, than I would with an external consultant. That's me. Uh, uh, I'm just distinguishing between the two. Uh, and it may be that some of that policy generating work can be accomplished without expending funds uh, or generated or developed. Uh, I don't know that that's quite as urgent uh, as the um, immediacy of the um, other ones, uh, of the of the actual documents that need to be generated. 
that's how my mind works. Uh, I'm yeah. not asking for, you know, feedback or response. It's just I'm giving my feedback in terms of just general thoughts. You, you can respond well, uh, if you'd like. I know I, I'm sensitive to your time, but I think, you know, building on Michelle's question a, a, a few minutes ago and Katie's as well is, you know, the immediate thing is not to get further behind with the HBRs that we have. And again, thinking about this funding, this funding wouldn't, you, if you recommend it and the council supports it and, and authorizes it, it wouldn't actually be available until July 1 of 2023. Mm -hmm. um, but we just don't want to get further behind in, in these HBRs. And I think there's time working with the Historical Commission, working with our town attorney, and working with, you know, bringing through you for your input, perhaps some new policy around, you know, is there a dollar figure that the town invests in property X or property Y? And is there a threshold that requires a 30 year agreement, a 40 year agreement, an agreement in perpetuity? I will say that not unlike a conservation restriction or an APR, the other thing that goes with this and part of the work is, and, and Michelle works in, in, in the field of conservation restrictions, and I know she's, she's more of an expert even than I am, but there's a lot of baseline work that goes into this. Um, you, you really have to get an architect to look at building A or B or C and say, what are the historic features of this building? And what are we trying to preserve? What are the dimensions of the building? All of that has to be packaged and then linked with the historic preservation restriction so that somebody a year from now, 10 years from now, or 50 years from now can look at that, preferably, of course, digitally now, and say, oh, yeah, you'd like to change out something in the windows or, or you know, something is rotted in the porch. Here's what you can do. So, so it's more than just a five-page or 10-page historic preservation restriction. It's all the accompanying appendices that support why is it that the town has invested $100,000 or $300,000 in, in preserving this church or this building in, you know, in this historic district. So anyway, uh, I, don't, I don't want to take more of your time because I know uh, it's good. Uh, thank you for uh, responding. Um, and I had one other question. And I, you know, maybe it's too specific, which is why are the current covenants and restrictions not sufficient? In other words, what aspects of the existing templates that we've been using aren't desirable? I read the, a couple of the ones that were provided. Uh, they seem to cover, I guess this sort of gets back to what Matt was saying, uh, that you know, if there's a general template, is there a way to, you know, and maybe this longer term would be a goal for various elements of the town to come up with some process to ease the burden on the, uh, on the town staff. Uh, related to taking a proposal and tweaking it, because uh, we've, right. we've had a lot of programs to date, a lot of uh, historic preservation awards to date on any given year, going back many years. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm gathering from what you're saying that most of those have some form of restriction affiliated with the agreement. Um, well, I think the, the, the short answer to your question, though, Sam, is yes, the boilerplate is important, but no two properties are the same. Yep. So okay. it's when you get into negotiating and going back and forth with the applicants, in this case, an applicant who has been funded through the you and the town council, that's when the legal fees start adding up. Those two mm -hmm. lawyers need to go back and forth. There's specific language on it could be it could be, you know, what can be done to that porch, what can be done to that historic fence, um, you know, whatever it might be. And that's where you that's where you get into the weeds. So yes, the template includes standard language, but there are sections that every each each HBR is unique in some way to that structure. Might so it, that's uh... where the back and forth gets. And, and up until now, it's been town attorney doing that work. Mm -hmm. And we just get in line with our town attorney. She does a wonderful job, but um, also the town picks up the tab for that outside of CPA funding. And it's it seems, significant over time. It seems to make sense to have some sort of standardized, pro not standard, but close to standardized process. And there may be one suggestion could conceivably be that uh, 
if there's amount of work being funded, maybe it's not all of the aspects of the building, but whatever aspect that does get funded, an HPR exists for that. If they're doing the roof, you can't change the roof. That probably would lead to less rejections from the applicants. I, and less, don't, uh, yeah, less I don't think the Mass Historical Commission would ever accept something okay. like that because okay. then you could you could destroy all the other features of the building, but say, oh, I have a slate roof is still fine, but I've changed everything out and I, I put um, vinyl siding all over this, you know, 1750s house. So, so um, I've asked the questions that I had. Thank you for mine. I see Robin has a hand up again, and uh, thank you for staying on, Dave. And uh, 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 not pinch hitting as you always or often do, um, Robin. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that the Historical Commission has been working. We were working with Ben. Uh, now we'll be working with Nate until Ben's replacement is hired. Um, but we have been having discussions about what an appropriate and effective restriction policy is. And so that'll continue in our work. And I think I recall the language because we've been discussing this from the CPA laws that uh, when the town acquires an interest, that's the, I think that's the phrase of the CPA law, um, which can be interpreted a lot of ways. But um, one uh, method that I can't remember which community, but um, some communities use a method where they require um, that the prop individual property becomes its own local historic district, which is um, a different approach. But anyway, when, uh, when we meet, we can um, maybe look a little bit more into what are, other towns are doing. And, and we're, we're interested in moving that process along um, to be more flexible and more functional for, for both the towns and the applicants. Great. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Dave? Dave, do you have any final comment you'd like to make before we? Oh, no, just want to thank everybody. And, and I will take Michelle's comment back to Nate and, and some Christine Prestrup, our, our planning director, just in terms of, frankly, is $20,000 a good figure if there are more, if, you know, if, if there are going to be more projects on the tarmac come July 1st, 2023, you know, again, this might be a way to get started, or we just come back to you next year and say, oh, well, we got three HBRs done for X, and we need an, another slug of money to cover, cover legal fees. It something seems like, like an administrative expense. So. Yeah, and I would defer to Sonia and Sean as to whether this goes under a CPA administrative fees or 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 whether it is truly a historic, um, you know, uh, request. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your very long day to uh, follow up and answer the questions and help us. Uh, so that, that concludes our presentations. Uh, I, I do want to open up uh, the floor for any public comments. Granted, it's later than we anticipated. I do see one individual who's not a committee member in the audience. Uh, if there are any public comments, uh, we'd be glad to hear them at this time. Uh, please raise your hand if you, you have one. So I'm not seeing any uh, public comments, which is fine from our uh, timing standpoint. Uh, Sonia, we asked earlier, I just want to confirm, is it correct that there are no uh, financial updates uh, needed at this time? Correct. Okay. So we have one last item on the agenda, which uh, I added, uh, which is a review of the straw poll rating process. I'm bringing this up because we have two new members on our committee. Um, and I think it, uh, will be helpful to uh, Matt and Michelle just to have an understanding of how we go about it. Uh, it's not the same every year. I did send a few documents to you, Sonia and Sean, uh, three days ago, asking that they are able to be made available to the committee. Uh, now, I can share them on my screen if that works, or if not, if you have them, that could work as well. I, I don't have them. I'm not on my. Uh desktop okay. from work, so. Am I able to display my screen? My, uh, screen? You should be. Okay, so uh, I just hit the share screen. So uh, I'll do so in a moment. Uh, what we do, uh, what we have done, uh, at least during my time in the committee, uh, 
is the committee members individually consider all of the proposals. Uh, and there's lots of different factors to consider. They're in the plan, the different criteria, and I'll display them. I know that you both looked through the plans. I had sent them to you earlier. Um, but every committee member thinks about all the different proposals using their own process. Uh, we have some recommended processes that have been adopted by some. But after doing so, after all the public comments when we meet, the first thing we do is even we've done this even before we've come up with a certainty of our budget because sometimes it flexes based on need is we ask the applicants to come up with a rating of one to five on each of the projects five being this is phenomenal i really want to support it one being this is not a project that i think is warranted essentially uh there is no requirement as to what the uh, exact definition is of a one, two, three, four, or five. Uh, it's subjective based on your own analysis of reviewing all the factors of what's in front of us and how much there's two elements. There's the uh, merits of the project, for lack of a better term. And we also have budgeting that we have to consider. Uh, in the past, I've had projects that I thought were really good, but I thought the number was wrong and I might lower my rating. Other people might think this is a phenomenal project regardless of the number, uh, but we use this one to five rating and we go through each of the projects without really talking about the merits or anything. Uh, and that's just to get a sense of the committee. That's the starting point that we use. We get a general rating of which projects seem to have more support and are more favorable than others. And then from there, we're in a position to be able to start talking about them. There may be a few that can be ruled out, that it's quite clear that the committee is not in favor of. Uh, and it's a method to help us uh, move forward. So I'm letting you both know that because between now and Really, it'll probably be the eighth uh, in the public meeting where we may have this uh, straw polling. Uh, you'll want to think about the different projects and come up with your own ranking. It is not something that is set in stone because after we do this ranking, we then talk about them all and we might be influenced by the conversation of others. Uh, so it's not like, oh my gosh, this is my number, this is it, I'm firm, fixed, and it's done. It's, this is what you think, and it assists our discussion process. So that's what we refer to as straw polling as opposed to voting. Uh, we don't want to use the word vote because that has legal implications. Uh, thank you, Anna, from last year. Uh, but uh, it's a polling process. So some of the things to consider I'm going to show on my screen, and you probably already would do so, but I think it might be helpful for me to show these to you, and if need be, we can... Uh, email them. So bear with me, please, uh, while I get my screen uh, to be shared here. Can everyone see my uh, busy desktop? Yes. Okay. Welcome to my world is the, I don't know if it's Eddie Arnold's song or Ray Price. <laughs> uh, bear with me. I'll try to enlarge. CPA presentation. So um, a few of the things that are taken from the plan are the evaluation criteria. This is what we communicate to the public. Uh, I'm opening this document now. Hopefully it will open. So these, I, these evaluation criteria as listed here, uh, you can find them in the plan. I believe it's on page uh, 13 or 14. Um, so on your own, you can look at the plan. This just projects will be evaluated by the way in which they do X, Y, Z. Uh, additional criteria can be all of these different things. But these are the factors that help with the discussion and help with our own coming to be. Uh, I'd be glad to send these to you, but you can find it in the plan as well. So I'm going to close this out. Uh, we also have from the plan, uh, there are references to something called goals. Now, there are different definitions uh, in management and in organizations as to what a goal actually is, what an objective actually is. Uh, but the essence are, these are 
uh, criteria worth considering uh, uh, associated with the different categories. Some might have more than others. Uh, these were all taken from the plan. Uh, uh, this page, I think, originated from Andy's spreadsheet where he took the majority of the contents of the evaluation criteria and goals and put them into a spreadsheet. I'll show that to you in a bit. Uh, but the underlying factors for any given category are these types of items. Uh, any member can look at them and look at any project as they wish and say, this is what makes sense to me, this doesn't. But I'm just bringing this to your attention to uh, assist. It may just be, I like this project a lot, but it can be helpful to actually, you know, kind of go through a step-by-step -step process with each project. This is taken from the CPA plan. Uh, we had a thorough discussion about two years ago, I think it was, uh, when we were contemplating different types of means for members to come up with their initial ratings. And two different types of features came up. One was a um, just a form. Uh, Robin, I believe this was you, and uh, it might have just been you, or it was you and Sarah Eisenberg. Uh, that put this together and it just kind of delineated the steps uh, that were suggested or that actually you went through Robin in terms of how to look at the proposals and I can send these to the committee okay so we don't have to talk about them thoroughly here but you know clarity of purpose eligibility well, we know most are eligible other funds sought feasibility timeline urgency budget uh, what do the town committee says and uh, what town funds are applied to this work, et cetera. That's one method of thinking about things. Uh, another method, which uh, I'll show in a moment here, is one that Andy did a lot of work on uh, to put together to uh, have a more mechanized, for lack of a better term, way of looking at the projects. Uh, some people liked using the form. Some people like using the spreadsheet I'm going to show you. You can use whatever you want. Uh, and or you know just just try to have a consistency with it. So I'm going to display a, a spreadsheet that's not populated with data, Andy. So this won't have everything that you had previously. Uh, and, and whoop, it's not that one. Excuse me. I think it was that one. There's two other tabs. I think it's this one here. Uh, you had had a spreadsheet where you had all of the different uh, criteria and projects, and this can be made available. Basically, all the projects were listed that were under community housing, historic preservation, open space and recreation, what's the budget, and over on the right-hand side uh, are the varying criteria and goals. Uh, these are the different goals, primary criteria, uh, and additional criteria serves more than one, supports the AMR sustainability goals, et cetera. These items across the top, and forgive me, I'll let you speak in a moment, Andy, uh, represent the Word documents that I and the uh, uh, that I had showed you earlier. But this is actually a means of assigning points to each particular category where they will be summed, and you can consider that as an avenue of doing the rating. Uh, I'm just broaching this subject so that you're aware of the different types of thought processes that members have used in the past. Um, Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about this form? Um, you, even though it's I not populated it, and incomplete? Yeah, no, you know, I can share my screen for a sec because I have it up here as well. And I actually okay. did help with it. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the important thing is just whatever method you use that you're you're evaluating things consistently. Uh, let's see which can you guys see the screen? Somebody's in London. Uh, oh wait, did I move from the wrong? What screen am I sharing? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, can you guys see what can you see on my screen? I can see the screen. Spreadsheet populated with information. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, so yeah, it's um, the one thing that that uh, 
uh, it didn't show up when Sam was walking through is just, um, you know, I've got some some criteria that just that you'd use. So it's not so much a number, you just put your criteria in. And then as uh, as was mentioned, it'll it'll generate a score for you. Again, it's it's a means of doing it consistently. Um, and I find that, you know, when I've done this in the last two years, I'll go through the scoring mechanism and then um, I may I may land on that exact score or I may land on something slightly different, but um, it is uh, that's how it's configured. And I've I've linked these also to the uh, to our website to get the individual um, proposals as well. Um, this is I will say I, I I do this in Google Sheets, which is if people aren't familiar with it, it's it's Excel, but it's uh, it's web based by Google. So if anybody wants it, um, they're welcome to it. I will say it's I don't I won't like support it, <laughs> All right? I'm not an IT guy, but uh, it's certainly happy to to share it for folks. Should be pretty self explanatory otherwise. Uh, thanks, Andy, for uh, displaying that. I'd like to just add the comment that the one item that came to my mind uh, with your spreadsheet, it's a thorough means of having information in front of you in a single location, um, how one might weight the numbers of categories if one project has four goals and another has six goals, uh, you know, how one might assign the weights can be determined by the individual. Uh, but uh, I kind of adopted a, a dual method between uh, Andy's spreadsheet for information, then I adjusted for the budgets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I realize this is a lot of information. Uh, it's all available to you, but the essence that I'm trying to describe here is that uh, when you look at the proposals, just try to think about them in terms of, you know, what what the plan indicates and what you think of the varying goals and the evaluation criteria. Try to compare them, uh, being whatever whatever method you use. Uh, look at you know how you think it qualifies, and then come up with a number between one and five. Once we get to that point, then as a committee, we're going to get together and we're going to have to deliberate about budgets, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to immediately take any of our ratings and turn them into a vote. We're going to thoroughly go through all the different projects before we vote on anything. We're gonna have thorough discussions for all the different parameters where we don't have uh, uh, time limitations in terms of uh, uh, the next presentation, et cetera. So um, I wanted to take the time in this meeting to just bring this up. I know the existing six members who are here are already familiar with how they've looked at things and done it. Uh, hopefully it's not too much information uh but any questions uh from either of you on this yes michelle i was just wondering um who to direct questions to well you know um not breaking any open meeting laws just just general procedural stuff but um i guess also evaluation kind of things can i can i talk to you sam or should i just direct it to sonia or yeah how to, uh, what, how to... what types of questions um, I mean, things that may or may not be some specific to the projects, like just um, theoreticals or, or things like that. I would Maybe. say to CC both myself and Sonia on those. Okay, thank uh, you. And it may be, you, you could send it to me and CC Sonia if it's committee processes, if it's financial and time indicators, uh, you know, send them to Sonia and CC me. Um, the, there is information available from the uh, CPA coalition in Massachusetts that has a website, they can be helpful in terms of general information. Open meeting laws is a different uh, category. That's a town, it's a state regulation. There are materials that you should have received at this point in time. Uh, I guess I should ask this, have you and have you, Matt, both uh, been sworn in as committee members? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. So there was an open meeting law requirement affiliated with that. Uh, well, I think both Michelle and I have already been on town committees. So okay, yes. okay. I think you have to do it for every committee, though. You have to get sworn in each time. But uh, that would be my recommendation that uh, CC email myself and or Sean, uh, sign it depending on the question. Any other questions or comments? 
Um, so we, you know, Andy indicated that if anyone has an interest in uh, looking at that, maybe we could share it uh, in time for the next meeting, perhaps. And Robin, so they weren't part of the committee here, but I can see to it that they get me emailed. Uh, I see a thumb up. So I think we'll email both of those forms. No need to use them. Uh, just take them for what you will. Uh, but as a committee, collectively, we've been uh, put together to discuss uh, all these projects on behalf of the town and collectively uh, good decisions tend to get made uh, usually. Uh, so that's how we're going to go forward. This has been a long meeting. Um, we have another, we have no meeting next week, Thanksgiving weekend holiday, and we will next meet on the 8th of, on the 1st of December. Uh, one thing that comes to mind for me is if we have additional questions, for uh, presenters that have already occurred. I know Dave had a couple, two simple questions. Can you get by this year with less essentially? And um, you know, it, can this be phased or delayed? I think we'll ask those of everyone, but if any of you have questions on the, the uh, presentations that have already occurred or pending questions that might come up for the next one, uh, please send them to Sonia and myself because they can be put together and we can send these out to uh, the applicants in advance of our deliberations. Uh, that usually is probably, uh, yes, Tim. Uh, yeah, I just want to have a little diff uh, different subject, but a, a quick question and clarification on the reserves. We talked about that earlier in the meeting. And roughly, we have five, roughly $500,000 in reserves. They can be used in two ways. One, it could add to the total request for fiscal 24. So if the 24 requests are a million, we could add 500. So we, in effect, could, quote, spend or allocate 1.5, right? That's number one. Number two is the one I was a little bit unsure of, and that is we could find, if we find a project has merit like right now before the end of fiscal 23, we could, we could recommend use of the reserves for fiscal 23 if we allocate before June 30th within that 500,000. Is that correct or am I correct. not? That's correct. Okay, so just putting that in our mind as we think through the projects. Okay, thanks. Um, just keep in mind, it still has to go through the same process. It still has to go to the finance committee. It still has to go to the council right. to be voted. I missed right, that right. step. Okay. By, uh, sorry about that, Sonia. I missed the step of going through the finance committee prior to going to the council. A um, number of applicants asked about the process. And well, there's a process. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, and I could have informed them. Um, so we'll send out, uh, the two different forms that some have used in the past, uh, members just consider all the different proposals. We need to hear all the applicants, uh, with there are, I believe five more that we have yet to hear from, uh, and they weren't the same, uh, openness of thought as the others. Uh, and then we'll go forward. It's a busy time of year for us. Uh, Thanks to everybody for sticking through this long meeting. Um, and again, if you have questions that you come up with in the last two sets of presentations today and on the 10th, or ones that you anticipate for the others, please try and email them over the course of the next week to uh, Sonia and myself uh, together. Uh, other than that, if unless there's something someone has to say at this point in time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 9.04 p.m. We will meet next December 1st, where we will have the next set of presentations. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. everybody. Good night. Good night.